People from the radically splintering mainstream of society in Europe and the United States today take a peculiar pleasure in considering themselves normal in comparison to legal offenders, political radicals, and other members of social outgroups. They treat this normalcy as if it is an indication of mental health and moral righteousness, regarding the others with a mixture of pity and disgust. But if we consult history, we can see that the conditions and patterns of human life have changed so much in the past two centuries that it is impossible to speak of any lifestyle available to human beings today as being normal in the natural sense, as being a lifestyle for which we adapted over many generations. Of the lifestyles from which a young woman growing up in the West today can choose, none are anything like the ones for which her ancestors were prepared by centuries of natural selection and evolution. It is more likely that the normalcy that these, t these people hold so dear is rather the feelings of normalcy that result from the conformity to a standard. Being surrounded by others who behave the same way, who are conditioned to the same routines and expectations, is comforting because it reinforces the idea that one is pursuing the right course. If a great many people make the same decisions and live according to the same customs, then these decisions and customs must be the right ones. But the mere fact that a number of people live and act in a certain way does not make it any more likely that this way of living is the one that will bring them the most happiness. Besides, the lifestyles associated with the American and European mainstream, if such a thing truly exists, were not exactly consciously chosen as the best possible ones by those who pursue them. Rather, they came to be suddenly as the results of technological and cultural upheavals. Once the peoples of Europe, the United States, and the world realize that there is nothing necessarily normal about their normal life, they can be begin to ask themselves the first and most important question of the new century. Are there ways of thinking, acting, and living that might be more satisfying and exciting than the ways we think, act, and live today? If the accumulated knowledge of Western civilization has anything of value to offer us at this point, it is an awareness of just how much is possible when it comes to human life. Our otherwise foolish scholars of history and sociology and anthropology can at least show us this one thing, that human beings have lived in a thousand different kinds of societies with 10,000 different tables of values, 10,000 different relationships to each other and the world around them, 10,000 different conceptions of self. A little traveling can still show you the same thing if you get there before Coca-Cola has had too much of a head start. That's why I can't help but scoff when some refer to human nature, invariably in the course of excusing himself for a miserable resignation to our supposed fate. Don't you realize we share a common ancestor with sea urchins? If differing environments could make these distant cousins of ours so di very different from us, how much more possible must small changes in ourselves and our interactions be? If there is anything lacking, and there sorely, sorely is, most will admit, in our lives, anything unnecessarily tragic or meaningless in them, any corner of happiness that we have not yet thoroughly explored, then all that is needed is for us to alter our environments accordingly. If you want to change the world, you must first change yourself, the saying goes. We have learned that the opposite is true. And there is another valuable discovery our species has made, albeit the hard way. We are capable of absolutely transforming environments. The place you lie, sit, or stand hearing this was probably altogether different 100 years ago, not to mention 2,000 years ago, and almost all of those changes were brought about by human beings. We have completely remade our world in the past few centuries, changing life for almost every kind of plant, animal, and ourselves most of all. It only remains for us to experiment with executing, or for that matter, not executing, these changes intentionally, in accordance with our needs and desires, rather than at the mercy of irrational, inhuman forces like competition, superstition, or routine. Once we realize this, we can claim a new destiny for ourselves, both individually and collectively. No longer will we be buffeted about by powers that seem beyond our control. Instead, in this exploration of ourselves through the creation of new environments, we will learn all that we can be. This path will take us out of the world as we know it, far beyond the farthest horizons we can see from here. We will become artists of the grandest kind, painting with desire as a medium, deliberately creating and recreating ourselves, becoming ourselves, our own greatest work. To accomplish this, we'll need to learn how to coexist and collaborate successfully, to see just how interconnected all our lives are, and finally learn to live with that in mind. Until this becomes possible, each of us will not only be denied the vast potential of her fellows, but her own potential as well. For we all make the world together that each of us must live in and be made by. The other thing that is lacking is the knowledge of our own desires. 
Desire is a slippery thing, amoebic and difficult to pin down, let alone keep up with. If we're going to make a destiny out of the pursuit and transformation of desire, we must first find ways to discover and release our loves and lusts. For this, not enough experience and adventure could ever suffice. So the makers of this new world must be more generous and more greedy than any who have come before. More generous with each other and more greedy for life. Even from here, I can taste the question already on the tip of your tongue. Isn't this utopian? Well, of course it is. You know what everyone's greatest fear is? It is that all the dreams we have, all the crazy ideas and aspirations, all the impossible romantic longings and utopian visions can come true. That the world can grant our wishes. People spend their lives doing everything in their power to fend off that possibility. They beat themselves up with every kind of insecurity, sabotage their own efforts, undermine love affairs, and cry sour grapes before the world has even had a chance to defeat them. Because no weight could be heavier to bear than the possibility that everything we want is possible. If that is true, then there really are things at stake in this life. Things to be truly won or lost. Nothing could be more heartbreaking than to fail when such success is actually possible. So we do everything we can to avoid trying in the first place. To avoid having to try. For if there is even the slightest possibility that our heart's desires could be realized, then of course the only thing that makes sense is to throw ourselves entirely into their pursuit and risk that heartbreak. Despair and nihilism seem safer, projecting our hopelessness onto the cosmos and as, a, and as, a, as an excuse for not even trying. So we remain, clutching our resignation, as secure as corpses in coffins, better safe and sorry. But this still cannot ward off that dreadful possibility. Thus, in our hopeless flight from the real tragedy of the world, we only heap upon ourselves false tragedy, unnecessary tragedy as well. Perhaps this world will never conform perfectly to our needs. People will always die before they are ready. Perfect relationships will end in ruins. Adventures will end in catastrophe, and beautiful moments will be forgotten. But what breaks my heart is the way we flee from these inevitable truths into the arms of more horrible things. It may be true that every man is lost in a universe that is fundamentally indifferent to him, locked forever in a terrifying solitude. But it doesn't have to be true that some people starve while others destroy food or leave fertile forms untilled. It doesn't have to be true that men and women waste their lives away working to serve the hollow greed of a few rich men just to survive. It doesn't have to be true that we never dare to tell each other what we really want, to share ourselves honestly, to use our talents and capabilities to make life more bearable, let alone more beautiful. That's unnecessary tragedy, stupid tragedy, pathetic and pointless. It's not even utopian to demand that we put an end to farces like these. If we could bring ourselves to believe, to really feel the possibility that we are invincible and accomplish whatever we want in this world, it wouldn't, it wouldn't seem such out of our reach at all to correct such absurdities. What I am begging you to do here is not to put faith in the impossible, but to have the courage to face that terrible possibility that our lives really are in our own hands and to act accordingly. To not settle for every misery fate and humanity have heaped upon us, but to push back, to see what one, which ones can be shaken off. Nothing could be more tragic and more ridiculous than to live out a whole life in reach of heaven without ever stretching your arms. A is for anarchy. No gods. Once, flipping through a book on child psychology, I came across a chapter about adolescent rebellion. It suggested that in the first phase of child's youthful rebellion against her parents, she may attempt to distinguish herself from them by accusing them of not living up to their own values. For example, if they taught her that kindness and consideration are important, she will accuse them of not being compassionate enough. In this case, the child has not yet developed herself or her own values. She still accepts the values and ideas that her parents passed on to her, and she is only able to assert her identity inside of that framework. It is only later, when she questions the very beliefs and morals that were presented to her as gospel, that she can become a freestanding individual. Far too many of us so-called radicals and revolutionaries show no signs of going beyond that first stage of rebellion. We criticize the actions of those in the mainstream and the effects of their society upon people and animals. We attack the ignorance and cruelty of their system, but we rarely stop to question the nature of what we all accept as morality. Could it be that this morality, which we think we can judge their actions, is itself something that should be criticized? When we claim that the exploitation of animals is morally wrong, what does that mean? Are we perhaps just accepting their values and turning these values against them, rather than creating moral standards of our own? Maybe right now you're saying to yourself, what do you mean, create moral standards of our own? Something is either morally right or it isn't. Morality isn't something you can make up. It's not a matter of mere opinion. Right there, you're accepting one of the most basic tenets of the society that raised you, 
that right and wrong are not individual valuations, but fundamental laws of the world. This idea, holdover from a deceased Christianity, is at the center of our civilization. If you're going to question the establishment, you should question it first. Where, is the, where does the idea of moral law come from? Once upon a time, almost everyone believed in the existence of God. This God ruled over the world. He had absolute power over everything in it, and he had set down his laws that all human beings had to obey. If they did not, they would suffer the most terrible punishments at his hands. Naturally, most people obeyed the laws as well as they could, their fear of eternal suffering being stronger than the desire for anything forbidden. Because everyone lived according to the same laws, they could agree upon what morality was. It was the set of values decreed by God's laws. Thus, good and evil, right and wrong, were decided by the authority of God, which everyone accepted out of fear. One day, people began to wake up and realize that there was no such thing as God after all. There was no hard evidence to demonstrate his existence, and few people could see any point in having faith in the irrational any longer. God pretty much disappeared from the world. Nobody feared him or his punishments anymore. But a strange thing happened. Though these people had the courage to question God's existence, and even deny it to the ones who still believed in it, they didn't dare to question his morality that his laws had mandated. Perhaps it just didn't occur to him. Everyone had been raised to hold the same beliefs about what was moral, and had come to speak about right and wrong in the same way. So maybe they just assumed it was obvious what was good and what was evil, whether God was there to enforce it or not. Or perhaps people had become so used to living under these laws that they were afraid to even consider the possibility that the laws didn't exist any more than God did. This left humanity in an unusual position. Though there was no longer an authority to decree certain things absolutely right or wrong, they still accepted the idea that some things were right or wrong by nature. Though they no longer had faith in a deity, they still had faith in a universal moral code that everyone had to follow. Though, no, though they no longer believed in God, they were not yet courageous enough to stop obeying his orders. They had abolished the idea of a divine ruler, but not the divinity of his code of ethics. This unquestioning submission to the laws of a long-departed heavenly master has been a long nightmare from which the human race is only just beginning to awaken. God is dead, and with him, moral law. Without God, there is no longer any objective standard by which to judge good and evil. This realization was very troubling to philosophers a few decades ago, but it hadn't really had much of an effect in other circles. Most people still seem to think that a universal morality can be grounded in something other than God's laws, and what is good for people, and what is good for society, and what people call, feel called upon to do. But explanations of why these standards necessarily constitute universal moral law are hard, hard to come by. Usually the arguments for the existence of moral law are emotional rather than rational. But don't you think rape is wrong, more or less asked, as if a shared opinion were a proof of a universal truth? But don't you think people need to believe in something greater than themselves, they appeal, as if needing to believe in something can make it true. Occasionally, they even resort to threats. But what would happen if everyone decided that there is no good or evil? Wouldn't we all kill each other? The real problem with the idea of universal moral law is that it asserts the existence of something that we have no way to know anything about. Believers in good and evil would have us believe that there are moral truths. That is, there are things that are morally true of this world, in the same way that it is true that the sky is blue. They claim, it is true of this world that murder is morally wrong, just as it is true that water freezes at 32 degrees. But we can investigate the freezing temperature of water. We can measure it and agree together that we have arrived at some kind of objective truth, insofar as such a thing is possible. On the other hand, what do we observe if we want to investigate whether it is true that murder is evil? There is no tablet of moral law on a mountaintop for us to consult. There are no commandments carved into the sky above us. All we have to go on are our own instincts and the words a bunch of priests and other self-appointed moral experts, many of whom don't even agree. As for the words of priests and moralists, if they can't offer any hard evidence from this world, why should we believe their claims? And regarding our instincts, if we feel that something is right or wrong, that may make it right or wrong for us, but that's not proof that it's universally good or evil. Thus, the idea that there are universal moral laws is mere superstition. It is a claim that things exist in this world which we can never actually experience or learn anything about, and we would do well not to waste our time wondering about things we can never know anything about. When two people fundamentally disagree over what is right or wrong, there is no way to resolve the debate. There is nothing in this world to which they can refer to see which one is correct. 
because there really are no universal moral laws, just personal evaluations. So the only important question is where your values come from. Do you create them for yourself, according to your own desires, or do you accept them from someone else, someone else who has disguised their opinions as universal truths? Haven't you always been a little suspicious of the idea of universal moral truths anyway? This world is filled with groups and individuals who want to convert you to their religions, their dogmas, their political agendas, their opinions. Of course they will tell you that one set of values is true for everybody, and of course they will tell you that their values are the correct ones. Once you're convinced that there is only one standard of right and wrong, they're only a step away from convincing you that their standard is the right one. How carefully we should approach those who would tell us the idea of universal moral law then. Their claim that morality is a matter of universal moral law is at base just a devious way to get us to accept their values, rather than forging values of our own which might conflict with theirs. So, to protect ourselves from the superstitions of the moralists and the trickery of the evangelists, let us be done with the idea of moral law. Let us step forward into a new era in which we will make values of our own rather than accepting moral laws out of fear and obedience. Let this be our new creed. There is no universal moral code that should dictate human behavior. There is no such thing as good or evil. There is no universal standard of right and wrong. Our values and morals come from us and belong to us, whether we like it or not. So we should claim them proudly for ourselves as our own creations, rather than seeking some external justification for them. But if there's no good or evil, if nothing has any intrinsic moral value, how do we know what to do? Make your own good and evil. If there's no moral law standing over us, that means we're free. Free to do whatever we want. Free to be whatever we want. Free to pursue our desires without feeling any guilt or shame about them. Figure out what it is you want in your life and go for it. Create whatever values are right for you and live by them. It won't be easy by any means. Desires pull in different directions. They come and go without warning. So keeping up with them and choosing among them is a difficult task. Of course, obeying instructions is easier, less complicated. But if we just live our lives as we have been instructed to, the chances are very slim that we will get what we want out of life. Each of us is different and has different needs. So how could one set of moral truths work for each of us? If we take responsibility for ourselves and each carve our own table of values, then we will have a fighting chance of attaining some measure of happiness. The old moral laws are left over from days when we lived in fearful submission to a non-existent God, anyway. With their departure, we can rid ourselves of all the cowardice, submission, and superstition that has characterized our past. Some misunderstand the claim that we should pursue our own desires to be mere hedonism. It is not the fleeting, um, insubstantial desires of the typical libertine that we are speaking about here. It is the strongest, deepest, most lasting desires and inclinations of the individual. It is her most fundamental loves and hates that should shape her values. And the fact that there is no God to demand that we love one another and act virtuously does not mean that we should not do these things for our own sake if we find them rewarding, which almost all of us do. But let us do what we want for our own sake, not for obedience. But how can we justify acting on our ethics if we can't base them on universal moral truths? Morality has been justified externally for so long that today we hardly know how to conceive of it in any other way. We have always had to claim that our values proceeded from something external to us because basing values on our own desires was, not surprisingly, branded evil by the preachers of moral law. Today we still feel instinctively that our actions should be justified by something outside of ourselves, something greater than ourselves, if not by God, then by moral law, state law, public opinion, justice, love of man, etc., we have been so conditioned by centuries of asking permission to feel things and do things, of being forbidden to base any decisions on our own needs, that we still want to think we are obeying a higher power, even when we act on our own desires and beliefs. Somehow, it seems more defensible to act out of submission to some kind of authority than in service of our own inclinations. We feel so ashamed of our aspirations and desires, we would rather attribute our actions to something higher. But what could be greater than our own desires? What could possibly provide better justification for our actions? Should we be serving something external without consulting our desires, perhaps even serving against our desires? This question of justification is where so many otherwise radical individuals and groups have gone wrong. They attack what they see as injustice, not on the grounds that they don't want to see such things happen, but on the grounds that it is morally wrong. By doing so, they seek the support of everyone who still believes in the fable of moral law, and they get to see themselves as the servants of truth. These people should not be taking advantage of popular delusions to make their points, but should be challenging assumptions and questioning traditions in everything they do. 
an improvement in, for example, animal rights, which is achieved in the name of justice and morality is a step forward at the cost of two steps back. It solves one problem while reproducing and reinforcing another. Certainly such improvements could be fought for and attained on the grounds that they are desirable. Nobody who truly considered it would really want to needlessly slaughter and mistreat animals, would they? Rather than with tactics left over from Christian superstition. Unfortunately, because of centuries of conditioning, it feels so good to feel justified by some higher force, to be obeying moral law, to be enforcing justice, and fighting evil, that it's easy for people to get caught in their, in their role as moral enforcers, and forget to question whether the idea of moral law makes sense in the first place. There is a sensation of power that comes from believing that one is serving a higher authority, the same one that attracts people to fascism. It's always tempting to paint any struggle as good against evil, right against wrong, but that is not just an oversimplification, it is a falsification, for no such things exist. We can act compassionately towards each other because we want to, not just because morality dictates, you know. We don't need any justification from above to care about animals and humans, or to act to protect them. We need only feel in our hearts that it is right, that it is right for us, to have all the reason we need. Thus we can justify acting on our ethics without basing them on moral truths, simply by not being ashamed of our desires, by being proud enough of them to accept them for what they are as the forces that drive us as individuals. And our own values might not be right for everyone, it's true. But they are all each of us have to go on, so we should dare to act on them rather than wishing for some impossible greater justification. But what would happen if everyone decided that there is no good or evil? Wouldn't we all kill each other? This question presupposes that people refrain from killing each other only because they have been taught that it is evil to do so. Is humanity really so absolutely bloodthirsty and vicious that we would all rape and kill each other if we weren't restrained by superstition? It seems more likely to me that we desire to get along with each other at least as much as we desire to be destructive. Don't you usually enjoy helping others more than you enjoy hurting them? Today most people claim to believe that compassion and fairness are morally right, but this has done little to make the world into a compassionate and fair place. Might it not be true that we would act upon our natural inclinations to human decency more rather than less if we did not feel that charity and justice were obligatory? What would it really be worth, anyway, if we all did fulfill our duty to be good to each other, if it was only because we were obeying moral imperatives? Wouldn't it mean a lot more for us to treat each other with consideration because we want to, rather than because we feel required to? And if the abolition of the myth of moral law somehow causes more strife between human beings, won't that still be better than living as slaves to superstitions? If we make our own minds up about what our values are and how we will live according to them, we at least will have the chance to pursue our desires and perhaps enjoy life, even if we have to struggle against each other. But if we choose to live according to the rules set for us by others, we sacrifice the chance to choose our destinies and pursue our dreams. No matter how smoothly we might get along in the shackles of moral law, is it worth the abdication of our self-determination? I wouldn't have the heart to lie to a fellow human being and tell him that he has to conform to some ethical mandate, whether it was in his best interest or not even if that lie would prevent a conflict between us. Because I care about human beings, I want them to be free to do what is right for them. Isn't that more important than mere peace on earth? Isn't freedom, even dangerous freedom, preferable to the safest slavery, to peace bought with ignorance, cowardice, and submission? Besides, look back at our history. So much bloodshed, deception, and oppression have already been perpetrated in the name of right and wrong. The bloodiest wars have been fought between opponents who each thought they were fighting on the side of moral truth. The idea of moral law doesn't help us get along, it turns us against each other, to contend over whose moral law is the true one. There can be no real progress in human relations until everyone's perspectives on ethics and values are acknowledged. Then we can finally begin to work out our differences and learn to live together without fighting over the absolutely stupid question of whose values and desires are right. For your own sake, for the sake of humanity, cast away the antiquated notions of good and evil and create your values for yourself. No masters. If you liked school, you'll love work. The cruel, absurd abuses of power, the self-satisfied authority that the teachers and principals lorded over you, the intimidation and ridicule of your classmates don't end at graduation. Those things are all present in the adult world, only more so. If you thought you lacked freedom before, wait until you have to answer to shift leaders Managers, owners, landlords, creditors, tax collectors, city councils, draft boards, law courts, and police. 
When you get out of school, you may escape the jurisdiction of some authorities, but you enter the control of even more domineering ones. Do you enjoy being controlled by others who don't understand or care about your wants and needs? Do you get anything out of obeying the instructions of employers, the restrictions of landlords, the laws of magistrates, people who have powers over you that you would never have given them willingly? How is it that they get all this power anyway? The answer is hierarchy. Hierarchy is a value system in which your worth is measured by the number of people and things you control, and how dutifully you obey those above you. Weight is exerted downward through the power structure. Everyone is forced to accept and conform to this system by everyone else. You are afraid to disobey those above you, because they can bring to bear against you the power of everyone and everything under them. You are afraid to abdicate your power over those below you, because they might end up above you. In our hierarchical system, we're all so busy trying to protect ourselves from each other that we never have a chance to stop and ask if this is really the best way our society could be organized. If we could think about it, we'd probably agree that it isn't. For we all know happiness comes from control over our own lives, not other people's lives. And as long as we're busy competing for control over others, we're bound to be the victims of control ourselves. It is our hierarchical system that teaches us from childhood to accept the power of any authority figure, regardless of whether it is in our best interest or not. We learn to bow instinctively before anyone who claims to be more important than we are. It is hierarchy that makes homophobia common among poor people in the USA. They're desperate to feel more valuable, more significant than somebody. It is hierarchy at work when 200 punk rockers go to a rock club already a mistake, of course, to see a band, and for some stupid reason the club owner won't let them perform. There are 206 people at the club, 205 of whom want the band to play, but they all accept the decision of the club owner because he is older and owns the place, i.e. has more financial power and thus more legal power. It is hierarchical values that are responsible for racism, classism, sexism, and a thousand other prejudices that are deeply ingrained in our society. It is hierarchy that makes rich people look at poor people as if they aren't even human, and vice versa. It pits employer against employee, manager against worker, teacher against student, making people struggle against each other rather than work together in mutual aid. Separated this way, they can't benefit from each other's skills and ideas and abilities, but must live in jealousy and fear of them. It is hierarchy at work when your boss insults you or makes sexual advances at you and you can't do anything about it, just as it is when police flaunt their power over you. For power does make people cruel and heartless, and submission does make people cowardly and stupid. And most people in a hierarchical system partake in both. Hierarchical values are responsible for our destruction of the natural environment and the exploitation of animals led by the capitalist West. Our species seeks control over anything we can get our claws on, at any cost to ourselves or others. And it is hierarchical values that send us to war, fighting for power over each other, inventing more and more powerful weapons until finally the whole world teeters on the edge of nuclear annihilation. But what can we do about hierarchy? Isn't that just the way the world works? Or are there other ways that people could interact, other values we could live by? Hierarchy and Anarchy Resurrecting Anarchism as a Personal Approach to Life Stop thinking of anarchism as just another world order, just another social system. From where we all stand, in this very dominated, very controlled world, it is impossible to imagine living without any authorities, without laws or governments. No wonder anarchism isn't usually taken seriously as a large-scale political or social program. No one can imagine what it would really be like, let alone how to achieve it, not even the anarchists themselves. Instead, think of anarchism as an individual orientation to yourself and others, as a personal approach to life. That's not impossible to imagine. Conceived in these terms, what would anarchism be like? It would be a decision to think for yourself rather than following blindly. It would be a rejection of hierarchy, a refusal to accept the God-given authority of any nation, 
law, or other force as being more significant than your own authority over yourself. It would be an instinctive distrust of those who claim to have some sort of rank or status above the others around them, and an unwillingness to claim such status over others for yourself. Most of all, it would be a refusal to place responsibility for yourself in the hands of others. It would be the demand that each of us not only be able to choose our own destiny, but also do so. According to this definition, there are a great deal more anarchists than it seemed, though most wouldn't refer to themselves as such. For most people, when they think about it, want to have the right to live their own lives, to think and act as they see fit. Most people trust themselves to figure out what they should do more than they trust any authority to dictate it to them. Almost everyone is frustrated when they find themselves pushing against faceless, impersonal power. You don't want to be at the mercy of governments, bureaucracy, police, or other outside forces, do you? Surely you don't let them dictate your entire life. Don't you do what you want to, what you believe in, at least whenever you can get away with it? In our everyday lives, we are all anarchists. Whenever we make decisions for ourselves, whenever we take responsibility for our own actions rather than deferring to some higher power, we are putting anarchism into practice. So if we are all anarchists by nature, why do we always end up accepting the domination of others, even creating forces to rule over us? Wouldn't you rather figure out how to coexist with your fellow human beings by working it out directly between yourselves rather than depending on some external set of rules? The system they accept is the one you must live under. If you want your freedom, you can't afford to not be concerned about whether those around you demand control of their lives or not. Do we really need masters to command and control us? In the West, for thousands of years, we have been sold centralized state power and hierarchy in general on the premise that we do. We've all been taught that without police, we would all kill each other. That without bosses, no work would ever get done. That without governments, civilization itself would fall to pieces. Is all this true? Certainly it's true that today little work gets done when the boss isn't watching. Chaos ensues when governments fall, and violence sometimes occurs when the police aren't around. But are these really indications that there is no other way we could organize society? Isn't it possible that workers won't get anything done unless they are under observation because they are used to not doing anything without being prodded? More than that, because they resent being in inspected, instructed, and condescended to by their managers and don't want to do anything for them that they don't have to? Perhaps, if they are working together for a common goal, rather than being paid to take orders, working towards objectives that they have no say in and that don't interest them much, they would be more proactive. Not to say that everyone is ready or able to do such a thing today, but our laziness is conditioned rather than natural, and in a different environment we might find that people don't need bosses to get things done, and as for police being necessary to maintain the peace, we won't discuss the ways in which the role of law enforcer brings out the most brutal aspects of human beings, and how police brutality doesn't exactly contribute to peace. How about the effects of, on civilians? living in a police-protected state, once the police are no longer a direct manifestation of the desires of the community they serve, and that happens quickly whenever a police force is established, they become a power external to the rest of society and outside authority. They are a force acting coercively on the people of that society. Violence isn't just limited to physical harm. Any relationship that is established by force, such as the one between police and civilians, is a violent relationship. When you are acted upon violently, you learn to act violently back. Isn't it possible, then, that the implicit threat of police on every street corner, of the near omnipresence of uniformed, impersonal representatives of state power, contributes to tension and violence rather than dispelling them? If that doesn't seem likely to you, and you are middle class and or white, ask a poor black or Hispanic man how the presence of police makes him feel. When the standard forms of human interaction all revolve around hierarchical power. When human intercourse so often comes down to giving and receiving orders at work, at school, in the family, in the courts, how can we expect to have no violence in our society? People are used to using force against each other in their daily lives, the force of authoritarian power. Of course, using physical force cannot be far behind in such a system. Perhaps, if we were more used to treating each other as equals, 
to creating relationships based upon equal concern for each other's needs, we wouldn't see so many people resort to physical violence against each other. And what about government control? Without it, would our society fall into pieces, and our lives with it? Certainly, things would be a great deal different without governments than they are now. But is that necessarily a bad thing? Is our modern society really the best of all possible worlds? Is it worth it to grant masters and rulers so much control over our lives out of fear of trying anything different? Besides, we can't claim that we need government control to prevent mass bloodshed, because it is governments that have carried out the greatest slaughters of all, in wars, in holocausts, in essentially organized enslavement and obliteration of entire peoples and cultures. And it may be that when governments break down, many people lose their lives in the resulting chaos and infighting. But this fighting is almost always between other power-hungry hierarchical groups, other would-be governors and rulers. If we were to reject hierarchy absolutely, and refuse to serve any force above ourselves, there would no longer be any large-scale wars or holocausts. That would be a responsibility each of us would have to take on equally, to collectively refuse to recognize any power as worth serving, to swear allegiance to nothing but ourselves and our fellow human beings. If we all were to do that, we would never see another world war again. Of course, even if a world entirely without hierarchy is possible, we should not have any illusions that any of us will live to see it realized. That should not even be our concern. For it is foolish to arrange your life so that it revolves around something that you will never be able to experience. We should, rather, recognize the patterns of submission and domination in our own lives, and, to the best of our ability, break free of them. We should put the anarchist ideal, no masters, no slaves, into effect in our daily lives, however we can. Every time one of us remembers not to accept at face value the authority of the powers that be, each time one of us is able to escape the system of domination for a moment, whether it is by getting away with something forbidden by a teacher or boss, relating to a member of a different social stratum as an equal, etc., that is a victory for the individual and a blow against hierarchy. Do you still believe that a hierarchy-free society is impossible? There are plenty of examples throughout human history. The Bushmen of the Kalahari Desert still live without authorities, never trying to force or command each other to do things but working together and granting each other freedom and autonomy. Sure, their society is being destroyed by our more warlike one, but that isn't to say that an egalitarian society could not exist that was extremely hostile to and well defended against the encroachments of external power. In Cities of the Red Knight, William Burroughs writes about an anarchist pirate's stronghold a few hundred years ago that was just that. If you need an example closer to your daily life, Remember the last time you gathered with your friends to relax on a Friday night. Some of you brought food, some of you brought entertainment, some provided other things, but nobody kept track of who owed what to whom. You did things as a group and enjoyed yourselves. Things actually got done, but nobody was forced to do anything, and nobody assumed the position of master. We have these moments of non-capitalist, non-coercive, non-hierarchical interaction in our lives constantly, and these are the times when we most enjoy the company of others, when we get the most out of other people, but somehow it doesn't occur to us to demand that our society work this way, as well as our friendships and love affairs. Sure, it's a lofty goal to ask that it does, but let's dare to reach for high goals. Let's not settle for anything less than the best in our lives. B is for bourgeoisie. The martial law of public opinion. Public opinion is an absolute value to the bourgeoisie man and woman because they know they are living in a herd, a herd of scared animals that will turn on anyone it does not recognize as its own. They shiver in fear as they ponder what the neighbors will think of their son's new hairstyle. They plot ways to seem even more normal than their friends and co-workers. They don't dare fail to turn on their lawn, sprinklers, or dress appropriately for casual Fridays at the office. Anything that could drag them out of their routines is viewed as suspect at best. Love and lust are both diseases, possibly fatal, as are all the other passions that could drive one to do things that would result in expulsion from the flock. Keep them quarantined to secret affairs and teenage dates, to nightclubs and strip clubs, for God's sake. 
Don't contaminate the rest of us. Go wild when your football team wins a game. Drink yourself into oblivion when the weekend comes. Rent obscene movies if you have to. But don't you dare sing or run or make love out there. Under no circumstances admit to feeling anything that doesn't belong to the staff room or at the dinner party. Under no conditions admit to wanting anything more or different than what everyone else wants, whatever and whoever that might be. And of course, their children have learned this too. Even after the death matches of the grade school nightmare, even among the most rebellious and radical of the nonconformists, the same rules are in place. Don't confuse anybody as to where you stand. Don't use the wrong signifiers or subscribe to the wrong codes. Don't dance when you're supposed to be posing. Don't speak when you're supposed to be dancing. Don't mess with the genre or the moves. Make sure you have enough money to participate in the various rituals. To keep your identity intact, make it clear which subcultures and styles you're aligned to, which bands and fashions and politics you want to be associated with. You wouldn't dare risk your identity, would you? That's your character armor, your only protection against certain death at the hands of your friends. Without an identity, without borders, to define the edges of yourself, you'd just dissolve into the void, wouldn't you? The Generation Gap The older generations of the bourgeoisie have nothing to offer the younger ones because they have nothing in the first place. All their standards are hollow. All of their riches are consolation prizes. Not one of their values contains any reference to real joy or fulfillment. Their children sense this and rebel accordingly whenever they can get away with it. The ones that don't have already been beaten into terrified submission. So how has bourgeoisie society continued to perpetuate itself through so many generations? By absorbing this rebellion as part of the natural life cycle. Because every child rebels as soon as she is old enough to have a sense of self at all. This rebellion is presented as an integral part of adolescence, and thus the woman who wants to continue her rebellion into adulthood is made to feel that she is insisting on remaining a child forever. It's worth pointing out that a brief survey of other cultures and peoples reveal that this adolescence rebellion is not inevitable or natural. The perpetual rebellion of youth also creates deep gulfs between different generations of the bourgeoisie, which play a crucial role in maintaining the existence of the bourgeoisie as such, because the adults always seem to be the enforcers of the status quo and the youth do not have the perspective to see that their rebellion has been also absorbed into that status quo. Generation after generation of young people are able to make the mistake of identifying older people themselves as a source of their misfortunes, rather than realizing that these misfortunes are the result of a larger system of misery. They grow older and become bourgeoisie adults themselves, unable to recognize that they are merely placing their former enemies and still unable to bridge the so-called generation gap to learn from people of other age groups, let alone establish some kind of unified resistance with them. Thus, the different generations of the bourgeoisie, while seemingly fighting amongst themselves, work together harmoniously as components of the larger social machine to ensure maximum alienation for all. The Myth of the Mainstream the bourgeoisie man depends upon the existence of a mythical mainstream to justify his way of life. He needs this mainstream because his social ins instincts are skewed in the same way his conception of democracy is. He thinks that whatever the majority is, wants, does, must be right. Nothing could be more terrifying to him than this new development, which he is beginning to sense today, that there no longer is a majority if there ever was. Our society is so fragmented, so diverse, that at this point it is absurd to speak of a mainstream. This is a myth partly created by the anonymity of our cities. Almost everyone passes on the street as is a stranger. One mentally regulates these anonymous figures to the faceless mass one calls the mainstream, to which one attributes whatever properties one thinks of strangers as possessing. For the smug salesman, they all envy him for being even more respectable than they are. 
for the insecure bohemian rebel. They must disapprove of him for not being like they are. They must be part of the silent majority, that invisible force that makes everything the way it is. One assumes that they are the same normal people seen in television commercials. But the fact is, of course, that those commercials refer to an unattainable ideal, in order to keep everyone feeling left out and insufficient. The mainstream is analogous to this ideal, as it keeps everyone in line without ever actually making an appearance, and possesses the same degree of reality as the perfect family in the toothpaste advertisement. No one worries more about this absent mass than the bohemian children of the bourgeoisie. They bicker over how to orchestrate their protests to gain mass appeal for their radical ideas as if there is still a mass to appeal to. Their society is now made up of many communities, and the only question is which communities they should approach. And dressing nice, proper language and all, is probably not the best way to appeal to the most potentially revolutionary elements of their society. In the last analysis, the so-called mainstream audience, most of them, imagine they are dressing up for, at their demonstrations and political events, is probably just the specter of their bourgeoisie parents, engraved deep in their collective unconscious, collective psychosis, as a symbol of the adolescent insecurity and guilt they never got over. They would do better to cut their ties to the bourgeoisie entirely, by feeling free to act, look, and speak in whatever ways are pleasurable, no matter who is watching, even when they are trying to advance some political cause, for no political objective reached by activists in camouflage would be more important than beginning the struggle towards a world in which people will not have to disguise themselves to be taken seriously. This is not to pardon those insecure bohemians who use their activism not as a means of building ties with others, but rather as a way to set themselves apart in their desperation to purchase an identity for themselves. They believe that they must pay for it by defining themselves against others. You can recognize them by their self-righteousness, their pompous show of ideological certainty, the ostentatious way they declare themselves activists at every opportunity. Political activism is almost exclusively their sphere. Today, an exclusive is the key word. Until this changes, the world will not. Marriage and other substitutes for love and community. Reproduction is a big issue for the bourgeoisie man and woman. They can only have children under very precise circumstances. Anything else is irresponsible, unwise, a poor decision for the future. They must be prepared to give up every last vestige of their youthful, selfish freedom to have children. For the mobility their corporations demand and the strain of vicious competition have destroyed the community network that long ago used to share the labor of child-rearing. Now every family unit is a tiny military outpost, closed and locked to the outside world, both in their hearts and in the paranoia turned city planning of their suburbs. Each one is an isolated emotional economy to itself where scarcity is the key word. The father and mother must abandon their selves for the prescribed roles of caregiver and breadwinner. For the bourgeoisie world, there is no other way to provide for the child. Thus the bourgeoisie couple's own fertility has been made a threat to their freedom, and a natural part of human life has become a social control mechanism. Marriage and the nuclear family, as chain gang, have survived as a result of this calamity. Much of the misfortune of potential lovers everywhere. For as the young adventurer who keeps her lust strong and her appetite whetted with constant danger and solitude knows well, love and sexual desire cannot survive overexposure, especially in the dull and lifeless settings that most married partners share. The bourgeoisie husband sees the only lover he is permitted under the worst possible circumstances, after every other force in his world has had the chance to exhaust and infuriate him for the day. The bourgeoisie wife learns to punish and ignore as unrealistic and impractical. Her desire, her every desire for romance, spontaneity, wonder. Together they live in a hell of unfulfillment. What they need is a real community of caring people around them, so parenthood would not force them into unwanted respectability, so they would still be free to have the individual adventures they need to keep their time together sweet, so they would never find themselves so lost and desperately lonely. 
In just the same way, their steady supply of food, of conveniences, comforts, and diversions avail them not. For as every hitchhiker, every hero, every terrorist knows, these things gain their value through their absence, and can offer real joy only as luxuries happen upon in the pursuit of something greater. Constant access to sex, food, warmth, and shelter desensitizes a man to the very pleasures they afford. The bourgeoisie man has given up his chance to pursue real stakes in life, for the assurance that he will have these amenities and securities. But without real stakes in his lives, these can offer him no more real joy than the company of his fellow prisoners. The Joys of Surrogate Living you can take a quick tour of all the unacted desires of the bourgeoisie man just by turning on his television or stepping into one of his movie theaters. He spends as much time as he can in these various virtual realities because he instinctively feels that they can offer him more excitement and satisfaction than the real world. The saddest part is that, so long as he remains bourgeoisie, this may actually be true. And as long as he accepts the displacement of his desires onto the marketplace for paying, by paying for imitations of their fulfillment, he will be trapped in the empty role that is himself. These desires are not always pretty to see played out in technicolor and surround sound. The bourgeoisie man's dreams and appetites are as infected by the fetishization of power and control as his society is. The closest he seems to be able to offer to an expression of free, liberated desire is the fantasy of all-consuming destruction that appears again and again at the black heart of his wildest cinematic fever dreams. This makes sense enough. After all, in a world of nothing but strip malls and theme parks, what honest thing is there to do but destroy? The bourgeoisie man is not equipped to view his desires as anything but unfortunate weaknesses to be fended off with placebos, because his life has never been without the pursuit of pleasure. He has spent several centuries achieving higher and higher standards of survival, at the cost of everything else. Tonight he sits in his living room, surrounded by computers, can openers, radar detectors, home entertainment systems, novelty ties, microwave dinners, and cellular telephones, with no idea what went wrong. The bourgeoisie man is only possible by virtue of the blinders he wears that prevent him from imagining that any other way of life is possible. As far as he can tell, anyone from the impoverished migrant workers of his own nation to the monks of Tibet would be bourgeoisie too, if only they could afford it. He does his damnedest to maintain these illusions. Without them, he would have to face the fact that he has thrown his life away for nothing. The bourgeoisie man is not an individual. He is not a real person, although if he was, he would probably live in Connecticut. He is a cancer inside all of us. He can now be cured. C is for capitalism and culture. What is capitalism, anyway? Capitalism, that's like democracy, isn't it? And aren't the enemies of capitalism the opponents of democracy? Didn't we defeat them in the Cold War? Actually, capitalism and democracy are two very different things. That's democracy right. is, essentially, the idea that people should have control over their lives. The power should be shared by all rather than concentrated in the hands of a few. You say it, brother. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I tell you. <laughs> capitalism is something altogether different. In the United States and other Western nations, we're used to hearing that we live in a democratic society. It's true that we have a government that calls itself democratic, although whether each of us really has an equal say or much of a say at all in such a bloated and atrophied representative democracy is worth asking. But whether our society is itself democratic is another question entirely. Sure is. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Government is only one aspect of society, of course, and it is far from the most important one when it comes to considering day-to-day -day life. The economic system of any given society has more influence over daily life than any court or congress could, for it is economics that decides who has control over the lands, resources, and tools of the society, what people have to do each day to survive and get ahead, and ultimately how those people interact with each other and view the world. And capitalism is, in fact, one of the least democratic economic systems. In a democracy economy, 
each member of the society would have an equal say in how resources are used and how work is done. But in the capitalist economy, in which all resources are private property and everyone competes against each other for them, most resources end up in the control of a few people. Today, read corporations. Those people can decide how everyone else will work, since most of the others can't live without earning money from them. They even get to determine the physical and psychological landscape of society, since they own most of the land and control most of the media. And at bottom, they really aren't really in control either, for if they let their guard down and stop working to keep ahead, they will quickly be at the bottom of the pyramid with everyone else. That means nobody truly has freedom under the capitalist system. Everyone is equally at the mercy of the laws of competition. How does capitalism work? Here's how the free market is supposed to work. People are free to seek their fortunes as they choose, and the ones who work the hardest and provide the greatest value to society are awarded with the greatest wealth. But this system has a crucial flaw. It doesn't actually offer equal opportunities for everyone. Success in the free market depends almost entirely on how much wealth you already have. When capital is privately owned, an individual's opportunities to learn, work, and earn wealth are directly tied to the amount of wealth she has. A few scholarships cannot offset this. It takes resources of some kind to produce something of value, and if a person doesn't have those resources herself, she finds she is at the mercy of those who do. Meanwhile, those who already have those resources can make more and more wealth, and eventually, most of the wealth in society ends up in the hands of a few. This leaves everyone else with little capital to sell other than their own labor, which they must sell to the capitalists, those who control most of the means of production, to survive. This sounds confusing, but it's actually pretty simple. A corporation like Nike has plenty of extra money to open up a new shoe factory, buy new advertisements, and sell more shoes, thus earning themselves more money to invest. A poor sucker like you barely has enough money to open up a lemonade stand, and even if you did, you probably would be run out of business by a larger, more established company like Pepsi, which has more money to spend on promotion. Sure, there are success stories of little guys triumphing over the competition, but you can see why this doesn't usually happen. Chances are you'll end up working for them, if you need to earn a living. And working th for them reinforces their power, for although they pay you for your work, you can be sure that they're not paying you for its full value. That's how they make a profit. If you work at a factory and you make $1,000 worth of machinery parts every day, you probably only get paid $100 or less for that day's labor. That means someone is cashing in on your efforts. And the longer they do that, the more wealth and opportunities they have at your expense. How does this affect the average guy? This means that your time and creative energy are being bought from you, which is the worst part of all. When all you have to sell in return for the means to survive is your own labor, you are forced to sell your life away at incre increments just to exist. You end up spending the greater part of your life doing whatever you can get paid the most for, instead of what you really want to do. You trade your dreams for salaries and your freedom to act for material possessions. In your free time, you can buy back what you made during your time at work, at a profit to your employers, of course. But you can never buy back the time you spent at work. That part of your life is gone, and you have nothing to show for it but the bills you were able to pay. Eventually, you start to think of your own creative abilities and labor power as beyond your control, for you come to associate doing anything but relaxing, recovering from work, with the misery of doing what you are told rather than what you want. The idea of acting on your own initiative and pursuing your own goals no longer occurs to you except when it comes to working on your hobbies. Yes, there are a few people who find ways to get paid to do exactly what they've always wanted to do, but how many of the working people you know fit into that category? These rare, lucky individuals are held up to us as proof that the system works, and we are exhorted to work really, really hard so that one day we can be as lucky as they are too. The truth is that there are simply not enough job openings for everyone to be a rock star or a syndicated cartoonist. Somebody has to work in the factories and to mass-produce the records and newspapers. If you don't succeed in becoming the next world-famous basketball star and end up selling athletic shoes in a mall instead, you may not have tried hard enough. So it's your fault if you're bored there, right? But it wasn't your idea that there should be 1,000 shoe salesmen for every professional basketball player. If anything, you can only be blamed for accepting a situation that offers such poor odds. Rather than all competing to be the one at the top of the corporate ladder or the one in a million lottery winner, we should be trying to figure out how to make it possible for all of us to do what we want to do with our lives. For even if you were lucky enough to come out on top, what about the thousands and thousands who didn't make it? The unhappy office clerks, the failed artists, listless grill clerks, fed up hotel maids? Is it in your best interest to live in a world filled with people who aren't happy, who never got to chase their dreams, who maybe never even got to have dreams? What does capitalism make people value? 
As Jeanette writes in her article on product and process, under capitalism, our lives end up revolving around things, as if happiness is to be found in possessions rather than in free actions and pursuits. Those who have wealth have it because they spend a lot of time and energy figuring out how to get it from other people. Those who have very little have spent most of their lives working to get what they need to survive, and all that they have as a consolation for their lives of hard labor and poverty are the very few things they are able to afford to buy, since their lives themselves have been bought from them. Between those two social classes are the members of the middle class, who have been bombarded from birth with advertisements and other propaganda proclaiming that happiness, youth, meaning, and everything else in life are to be found in possessions and status symbols. They learn to spend their lives working hard to collect these things, rather than taking advantage of whatever chances they might have to seek adventure and pleasure. Thus, capitalism centers everyone's values around what they have rather than what they do, by making them spend their lives competing for the things they need to survive and achieve social standing. People might be more likely to find happiness in a society that encourages them to value their ability to act freely and do what they want above all else. To create such a society, we will have to stop competing for control and wealth and start to share them more freely. Only then will everyone be completely free to choose the lives they want most to live without fear of going hungry or being shut out of society. But doesn't competition lead to productivity? Yes, that's the problem. The competitive, free market economy not only only encourages productivity at all costs, it enforces it. For those who do not stay ahead of the competition are trodden under. And, And what costs exactly are we talking about here? For one thing, there are the long hours we spend at work, 40, 50, sometimes 60 hours a week, at the beck and call of bosses and or customers, working until we're well past exhausted in the race to get ahead. On top of this, there are the low wages we're paid. Most of us aren't paid nearly enough to afford a share of all the things our society has to offer, even though it is our labor that makes them possible. This is because in the competitive market, workers aren't paid what they deserve for their labor. They're paid the smallest amount their employer can pay without leaving them to look for better wages. That's the law of supply and demand. The employer has to do this because he needs to save as much extra capital as he can for advertising, corporate expansion, and other ways to try and keep ahead of the competition. Otherwise, he might not be an employer for long, and and his employees will end up working for some more competitive master. There's a word for these long hours and unfair wages, exploitation. But that's not the only cost of productivity our competitive system encourages. Employers have to cut corners in a thousand other ways, too. That's why our work environments often aren't safe, for example. And if it takes doing things that are ecologically destructive to make money and stay productive, an economic system that rewards productivity above all else gives corporations no reason to resist trampling over wildlife and wilderness to make a buck. That's where our forests went. That's where the ozone layer went. That's where hundreds of species of wild animals went. They were burned up in our rat race. In place of forests, we now have shopping malls and gas stations, not to mention air pollution, because it's more important to have places to buy and sell than it is to preserve environments of peace and beauty. In place of buffalo and bald eagles, we have animals locked in factory farms, turned into milk and meat machines. And singing cartoon animals in Disney movies, the closest thing to wild animals some of us ever see. Our competitive economic system forces us to replace everything free and beautiful with the efficient, the uniform, and the profitable. This isn't limited to our own countries and cultures, of course. Capitalism and its values have spread across the world like a disease. Competing companies have to keep increasing their markets to keep up with each other, whether whether by persuasion or by force. That's why you can buy Coke in Egypt and eat at McDonald's in Thailand. Throughout history, we can see examples of how capitalist corporations have forced their way into one country after another, not hesitating to use violence where they deemed it necessary. Today, human beings on almost every corner of the world sell their labor to multinational corporations, often for less than a dollar an hour, in return for the chance to chase the images and wealth and status those corporations use to tantalize them. The wealth that their labor creates is sucked out of their communities into the pockets of these companies, and in return, their unique cultures are replaced by the standard-issue monoculture of Western consumerism. By the same token, people in these countries can hardly afford not to seek to be competitive and productive themselves in the same ways that those are exploiting them are. Consequently, the whole world is being standardized under one system, the capitalist system, and it is getting hard for people to imagine any other way of doing things. So, what kind of productivity does competition encourage? It encourages material productivity alone, that is, profit at any expense. We don't get higher quality products, for it is in the manufacturer's best interest that we return to buy from them again and again when our cars and stereos break down after a few years. We don't get the products that are most relevant to our lives in pursuit of happiness either. We get the products that are easiest and most profitable to sell. We get credit card companies, telemarketers, junk mail, cigarettes carefully designed to condemn eight different addictive chemicals. 
In order that one company may outsell its competitors, we end up spending our lives working to develop, mass produce, and purchase things like garbage disposal units, conveniences that raise our standard of survival without actually improving our quality of life. Much more than better blenders or video games or potato chips, we need more meaning and pleasure in our lives. But we're all so busy competing that we don't even have time to think about it. Surely, in a less competitive society, we could still produce all the things we need without being forced to produce all the frivolous extra stuff that is presently filling up our landfills. And maybe then we could concentrate our efforts on learning how to produce the most important thing of all, human happiness. Don't tell me life would be better and more free in a system like the Soviet Union had. No, of course not. The Soviet Union's economy was no more democratic than the United States' economy is. In the United States, most capital is controlled by corporations, which in turn are able to exert control over the lives of their employees, and, to some extent, their customers and everyone else. In the Soviet Union, most capital was controlled by only one force, the government, which put everyone else at its mercy. And although there was no internal competition of the sort that drives Western corporations to such extremes of ruthlessness, the Soviet government still sought to compete against other nations in economic power and productivity. This drove them to the same extremes of ecological devastation and worker exploitation that are common in the West. In both systems, you can see the disastrous results of putting most wealth in the hands of a few people. What we need to try now is a system in which we can all have a share of the wealth of our society and a say in how we work and live. So, who exactly is it that gets power under capitalism? In a system where people compete for wealth and the power that comes with it, the ones who are the most ruthless in the pursuit are the ones who end up with the most of both of course. Thus, the capitalist system encourages deceit, exploitation, and cutthroat competition, and rewards those who go to those lengths by giving them the most power and the greatest say in what goes on in society. The corporations who do the best job of convincing us that we need their products, whether we do or not, are the most successful. That's how a company like Coca-Cola, which makes one of the most practically useless products on the market, was able to attain such a position of wealth and power. They were the most successful not at offering something of value to society, but at promoting their product. Coke is not the best tasting beverage the world has ever tasted. It is simply the most mercilessly marketed. The ones who are the most successful at creating an environment that keeps us buying from them, whether that means manipulating us with ad campaigns or using more devious means, are the ones who get the most resources to keep doing what they are doing. And thus, they are the ones who get the most power over the environments we live in. That's why our cities are filled with billboards and corporate skyscrapers, rather than artwork, public gardens, or bathhouses. That's why our newspapers and television programs are filled with slanted perspectives and outright lies. The producers are at the mercy of their advertisers, and the advertisers they depend on most are the ones who have the most money, the ones who are willing to do anything, even twist facts and spread falsehoods, to keep and get that money. Do a little research, and you'll see just how often this happens. Capitalism virtually guarantees that the ones who control what goes on in society are the greediest, the cruelest, and the most heartless. And since everyone else is at their mercy, and no one wants to end up on the losing side, everyone is encouraged to be greedy, cruel, and heartless. Of course, no one is selfish or hard-hearted all the time. Very few people want to be or get much pleasure out of it. But when they can avoid it, they do. But the average work environment is set up to make people cold and impersonal to each other. If somebody comes into a bagel shop starving and penniless, company policy usually requires that the employees send him away empty-handed rather than letting anyone have anything without paying, even if the bagel shop throws away dozens of bagels at the end of each day, as most do. The poor employees come to regard the starving people as a nuisance, and the starving people blame the employees for not helping them, when really it is just capitalism pitting them against each other. And sadly enough, it is probably the employee who enforces ridiculous rules like this the most strictly who will, who will advance to manager. Those who dare to spend their lives doing things that are not profitable generally get neither security nor status for their efforts. They may do, be doing things of great value to society, such as making art or music or doing social work, but if they can't turn a profit from these activities, they will have a hard time surviving, let alone gathering the resources to expand their projects. And, since power comes first and foremost from wealth, they will have little control over what goes on in their society as well. Thus, corporations that have no goals other than gathering more wealth and power for themselves always end up with more power over what goes on in a capitalist society than artists or social activists do. At the same time, few people can afford to spend much time doing things that are worthwhile but not lucrative. You can imagine what sort of effect this has. What kind of place does this make our world? The capitalist system gives the average person very little control over the collective capabilities and technologies of her society, and very little say in their deployment. 
Even though it is her labor, and that of people like her, that has made possible the construction of the world she lives in, she feels as though that labor, her own potential, and the potential of her fellow human beings, is foreign to her, outside of her control, something that acts upon the world regardless of her will. Small wonder if she feels frustrated, powerless, unfilled, dreamless. But it is not just this lack of control that makes capitalism so hostile to human happiness. In, in place of democratic control over our lives and our society, we have the heartless dominion of force. Violence is not only present when human beings do physical harm to each other. Violence is there, albeit in a subtler form, whenever they use force upon each other in their interactions. It is violence that is at the root of capitalism. Under the capitalist system, all the economic laws governing human life come down to coercion. Work or go hungry. Dominate or be dominated. Compete or perish. Sell the hours of your life away for the means to survive or rot in poverty or jail. Most people go to work because they have to, not because they want to. They sell their time to buy food and shelter and to pay the bills for all the status symbols and luxuries they have been conditioned to collect, only because they know that the alternative is starvation and ostracism. They may like some of the things they do at their jobs, but they would much rather do these things on their own time and in their own way, and do other things besides that their jobs leave them no time or energy for. To force the maximum productivity out of people who would rather be elsewhere, corporations use a thousand mechanisms of control. They schedule work hours for their employees, make them punch time clocks, keep them under constant observation. Bosses and workers are brought together under mutual economic duress, and they negotiate with each other under invisible threats. The one pointing the gun of employment and poverty to the other's head, the other threatening poor service and possibly strikes. Most people try to maintain some concern for the human needs of others, even on the job, but the essence of our economy is competition and domination, and that always comes out in our relationships with those above and below us in the work hierarchy. Can you imagine how much more advantageous and how much more fun it could be for all of us if we were able to act out of love rather than compulsion? If we did things for the sheer joy of doing them and worked together because we wanted to, not because we had to? Wouldn't that make it more enjoyable to do the things that are necessary for survival and to be around each other, for that matter? For these patterns of violence inevitably spill over into the rest of our lives, too. When you're used to regarding people as objects, as resources to be spent or enemies to be feared and fought, it's hard to leave those values behind when you come home. The hierarchy that private ownership imposes upon relationships in the workplace can be found everywhere else in society, in schools, in churches, in families, and in friendships, everywhere the dynamics of domination and submission take place. It's almost impossible to imagine what a truly equal relationship would consist of in a society where everyone is always jockeying for superiority. When children fight in grade school or rival gangs fight war in the streets, they are merely imitating the greater conflicts that take place between and within corporations and the nations that serve their interests. Their violence is regarded as an anomaly, but is just a reflection of the violent, competitive world that fostered them. When potential friends or lovers evaluate each other in terms of financial worth and status, rather than according to heart and soul, they are simply acting out the lessons they have been taught about market value. Living under the reign of force, it's almost impossible not to look at other human beings and the world in general in terms of what's in it for you. If we lived in a world where we could pursue whatever aspirations we pleased, without fear of dying hungry, crazy, and unloved like Van Gogh and a thousand others, our lives and relationships would no longer be modeled on violence. Perhaps it would be easier for us to look at each other and see what is beautiful and unique, to look at nature and appreciate it for what it is, to be and let be, rather than always seeking power and advantage. There have been hundreds of other societies in the history of our species in which people have lived that way. Is it really too much to think that we could reorganize our own society to be more democratic? Okay, okay, but what's the alternative? The alternative to capitalism would be a consensual society in which we could decide individually and, where necessary, collectively, what our lives and surroundings would be, instead of being forced into them by so-called laws like supply and demand. Those are only laws if we let them be. It's hard to imagine a society based on cooperation from this vantage point, since the only societies most of us have seen in our lives are based on competition. But such societies are possible. They've existed over and over in the history of our species, and they can exist again if we want. To escape from the fetters of competition, we need to develop an economy that is based on giving rather than trading, a gift economy in place of this exchange economy. In such a system, each person could do what she wanted to do with her life and offer to others what she felt most qualified to offer without fear of going hungry. The means to do things would be shared by everyone rather than hoarded up by the greediest individuals, so each person would have all the capabilities of society at her disposal. Those who wanted to paint could paint. Those who enjoy building engines and machines could do that. Those who love bicycles could bake and repair them for others. 
The so-called dirty work would be spread out around more fairly, and everyone would benefit from being able to do a variety of things rather than being limited to one trade, like a cog in a machine. Work itself would be a thousand times more pleasurable, without tight schedules or demanding bosses constraining us. And though we might have a slower rate of production, we would have a wider array of creative pursuits in our society, which could make life fuller and more meaningful for all of us. Besides, do we really need all the trinkets and luxuries we slave so hard to make today? This sounds like a utopian vision, and it is, but that doesn't mean that we can't make our lives a lot more than they are right now. We don't have to look only to the bushmen of the Kalahari Desert for examples of what life is like outside of capitalism, either. Even today, there are plenty of opportunities in our own society to see how much better life is when nothing has a price. Whenever a knitting circle meets to share friendship and advice, whenever people go camping together and divide up responsibilities, whenever people cooperate to cook or make music or do anything else for pleasure rather than money, that is the gift economy in action. One of the most exhilarating things about being in love or having a close friend is that, for once, you are valued for who you are, not what you're worth. And what a wonderful feeling it is to enjoy things in life that come to you for free, without having to measure how much of yourself you're exchanging for them. Even in this society, almost everything we derive real pr pleasure from comes from outside the confines of capitalist relations. And why shouldn't we demand all the time what works so well in our private lives? If we get so much more out of our relationships when they are free from the coercion of ownership and competition, why shouldn't we seek to free our work relationships from that coercion as well? But who will collect the garbage if we all do what we want? Well, when a group of friends live together in an apartment, doesn't the garbage get taken out? It might not get taken out as regularly as it would by a janitor at an office, but it gets taken out voluntarily, and it isn't always the same guy stuck doing it. To suggest that we can't provide for our own needs without authority forcing us is to vastly underestimate and insult our species. The idea that we would all sit around doing nothing if we didn't have to work for bosses to survive comes from the fact that, since we do have to work for bosses to survive, we would all rather sit around doing nothing. But if we had our energy and our time to ourselves, we could, we could rediscover how to use them, for practical purposes as well as impractical. Remember how many people enjoy gardening for its own sake, even when they don't have to do it to survive? Surely we wouldn't let ourselves starve to death in a society where we share decisions and power rather than fighting over them. And the fact that so many people are starving today indicates that capitalism is no less impractical than any other system might be. We're often told that it is human nature to be greedy, and that this is why our world is the way it is. The very existence of other societies and other ways of life contradicts this. Once you realize that modern capitalist society is only one of a thousand ways that human beings have lived and interacted together, you can see that this talk of human nature is nonsense. We are formed, first and foremost, by the environments we grow up in, and human beings now have the power to construct our own environments. If we are ambitious enough, we can design our world to reconstruct us in any shape our hearts desire. Yes, all of us are haunted by feelings of greed and aggression, living as we do in a materialistic and violent world. But in more supportive environments, built on different values, we could learn to interact in ways that would bring more pleasure to all of us. Indeed, most of us would be far more generous and considerate today if we could be. It's hard to give gifts freely in a world where you have to sell a part of yourself away in order to get anything at all. Considering that, it's amazing how many gifts we still give each other. The people who talk about human nature would tell us that this con nature consists chiefly of the lust to possess and control. But what about our desires to share and to act for the sheer sake of acting? Only those have given up on doing what they want content themselves by finding meaning in what they merely have. Almost everyone knows that it is more rewarding to bring joy to others than it is to take things from them. Acting freely and giving freely are their own reward. But those who think that from each according to the, her means to each according to her needs unfairly benefits the receivers have simply misunderstood what makes human beings happy. It's tempting to think of capitalism as a conspiracy of the rich against everyone else, and to conceive of the struggle against capitalism as a struggle against them. But in truth, it is in everyone's best interest that we do away with this economic system. If true wealth consists of freedom and community, we are all poor here, for even to be rich in society that is hostile to those things is only to possess the greatest amounts of poverty. This system is not the result of an evil plot by a few villains bent on world domination, even if, and even if it was, they've only succeeded in condemning everyone, themselves included, to the shackles of domination and submission. Let's not be too jealous for them just because they seem better off from a distance. Anyone who's grown up in one of their households can tell you that for all their bank accounts and sprinkler systems, they're no happier or freer than you are. We should try to find ways to make everyone see what it is to be gained from transforming our society and to evolve everyone in it. If that's a bit difficult challenge, and it sometimes seems to you that the masses deserve what they get for accepting this way of life, don't lose heart. Remember, the system they accept is the one you live under. Your chances for liberation are inextricably tied to theirs. 
Don't be paralyzed by the seeming vastness of the forces arrayed against us. Those work forces are made up of people just like you, yearning to break free. Find ways to escape from the system of violence in your own life, and take them with you when you can. Seize any free moment, any opportunity you can get your hands on. Life can be sold away, but it can't be bought, only stolen back. Postscript, a class war everyone can fight in. The poverty against which man has been struggling throughout history is not merely the poverty of material goods. The ennui and disorientation experienced by members of the middle and upper class in today's wealthy industrial nations have revealed the poverty of Western existence itself. The problems we face today cannot be traced to class conflict alone. It is not merely a question of the ruling class profiting at the expense of the proletariat, for we have seen that the profit that those who, with capital do make does not make their lives any more fulfilling. It does not matter whether a woman is buried alive in a prison, in a reform school, in a sweatshop, in a ghetto, in a prestigious university, in a condominium bought on credit, or in a mansion with a private swimming pool and tennis courts, so long as she is buried alive. Everyone suffers from today's status quo, albeit differently. But whether a man is starving on his minimum wage salary, exhausted by his repetitive responsibilities at the office, or befuddled by the feeling of emptiness that accompanies the undirected acquisition of material wealth, he has a stake in fighting for change. So we all, rich and poor, must band together to transform our situation. This also means that there is no mythical they. Innumerable radical movements and social critics have relied upon this concept to motivate people by stirring up hatred for the evil orchestrators of human suffering, the enemies who conspire against us. But this kind of thinking only serves to divide us against each other, and whether we are divided on class lines, on color lines, or according to other categories, we are distracted from the important issues and impeded in our progress. One true enemy is the social forces and patterns at work between us, and it is these forces which we must come to understand and to struggle against. This is not to say that there are not individuals whose behavior is particularly dangerous to their fellow human beings, insofar as it perpetuates and intensifies our present state of emergency. But even if these individuals do have negative intentions towards others, it is still unlikely that they possess a clear understanding of the extremely complicated conditions to which they are contributing. Our social and economic relations are snarled and harmful in such complex ways that no secret society of evil geniusness could ever have arranged this fate for us. And let no one say these individuals are benefiting at the expense of the rest of us. If gaining material wealth and status in a murderous society really is benefiting, then we should just let things stay the way they are and put our energy into fighting each against all to get to the top of the dung heap. If these people's lives are not as impoverished as our own, our whole value system is bankrupt, it's understandable that some of us are jealous of their disproportionate control over the resources of our society, but it's not having stuff for status that makes life good, is it? D is for death and domestication. Here's an exercise to try at home. You will need a working stopwatch or another timepiece that measures seconds. Before you begin, see yourself in a comfortable chair and loosen your clothing. Watch the second hand as it passes around the face of the clock. Picture the moment of your death perhaps many decades in the future, or perhaps only a few years or months. Who can know? Wait for the second hand to reach the starting point at the top of the clock face, and then watch as it records the passing of one minute of your life. Now imagine the clock counting down the minutes of your life to the moment of your death. Try this exercise picturing this moment a few decades in the future, then repeat it picturing the moment next year. Repeat it picturing the moment of your death next month, next week, tonight. After all, you never know. Now observe the moment in your, our hands on the clock. What were you doing at this time 24 hours ago? 48 hours ago? One month ago? What will you be doing at this time next week? Imagine that the moment of your death is one month away. Consider if you knew this was true. What would you be doing right now? What would you be doing at this time tomorrow? Repeat this step, imagining your death to be one year away. Does this make very much difference in your thoughts? About what, you, what will you do today, tomorrow, if you knew the day of your death? Compare your activities over the last 24 hours to the activities of what you have chosen if you had known that you would leave this world in one month or one year. Compare your activities over the last month, the last year, the last decade, to those you would have chosen if you had known that on this day you would have only 30 days or 12 months left to live. How different would your life have been if you had known the date of your approaching death? Would you be ready to die in a month or a year, having lived the life that you have? Chances are, at least as far as we all know, that most of, of the people who read this text and participate in this exercise will live for many, many more years afterwards. But still, look at the second hand of the stopwatch and follow it as it records the passing minutes, counting down the minutes of your life that remain to you as they slip away. Are you living the life that you want to live? 
Are you living a life that, at any given moment, you could look back upon with satisfaction if you suddenly realized that it was about to end? Are you living the sort of life that you would wish upon a, a human being? A life that is exciting and full, that is well spent every minute of it? If the answer is no, what can you do in the time that still remains to you, however long or short that may be, to make your life more like the one you would like to live? For we all do have only a limited amount of time granted to us in this world. We should use it with this in mind. If you find, looking back upon your life, that you have spent years living without any consideration of your mortality, this is really not unusual, for our social, cultural environment does not encourage us to think much about the limits the nature places on our lives. Death and aging are denied and hidden away as if they were shameful and embarrassing. The older members of our society are hidden away in retirement homes, like lepers in leper colonies. The billboards, magazine photos, and television commercials that meet our eyes at every turn show only images of healthy men and women in the prime of their life. Cemeteries, which once memorialized the dead and preserved a place for them in the thoughts of the living, are now forgotten in abandoned neighborhoods and overgrown with weeds. When a man dies, the rituals which one would have celebrated his life and brought the subject of human mortality to the thoughts of those who survived him are now often regarded as mere inconveniences. Death is impolite and embarrassing. It is considered bad etiquette. There is no time for it in today's busy world of corporate mergers and record-breaking conspicuous consumption. Our busy schedules and glossy magazines neither make allowance for it nor offer any explanation of how it might be relevant to our value system or our lives. And indeed, if we were to stop and ponder the subject, perhaps we would find that when we seriously consider the limits of our time on this planet, keeping up with television comedies and having a good resume seems less important than they did before. Our cultural silence about human mortality allows us to forget how much weight the individual moments of our lives carry, adding up as they do to our lives themselves. Thus we squander countless hours watching television or balancing checkbooks, hours that in retrospect we might have done better to have spent walking on the seashore with our loved ones, cooking gourmet meals for our children or friends, writing fiction, or hitchhiking across South America. The reality of our future death is not easy for any of us to come to terms with, but it is surely better that we consider this now than regret doing so when it is too late. Our denial of death has a deeper significance. Beyond its functions as a reaction to our fear of mortality, and a selective blindness that helps preserve the status quo. It is a symptom of our ongoing struggle to escape from cycles of change in nature and establish an unnatural permanence in the world. Our mortality is frightening evidence that we do not have control over everything. Thus we are quick to ignore it, if we cannot do away with it altogether, a feat towards which our medical researchers are working at breakneck speed. It is worth questioning whether this would even be desirable. Since the dawn of Western civilization, men and women have hungered for domination not only of the world and each other, but also for domination of the seasons, time itself. We speak of the eternal grandeur of our gods and empires, and we design our cities and corporations to exist into infinity. We build monuments, skyscrapers, which we intend to stand forever as testimony of our victory over the sands of time. But this victory can only come at a price, at this price, that though nothing passes away, nothing comes to be either. That the world we create is a static, standardized place that can hold no surprises for us anymore. We would do well to be wary of fulfilling our own darkest dreams by creating such a dystopia. A frozen world in which no one must fear death anymore. For everyone exists forever and no one lives for even an instant. Rimbaud's Deathbed Conversion Fall, 1891 Arthur Rimbaud converted on his deathbed to Christianity he once despised, setting a new precedent for living life to the fullest. Rimbaud was born as the second of four children to a farmer's daughter living in rural France. At the age of 16, he ran away to live homeless on the streets of Paris, writing poetry that was at once visionary and blasphemous. He made the acquaintance of the poet Verlaine, with whom he stayed until Verlaine's wife forced him to leave. Verlaine had fallen in love with him and continued to support him, despite the scandal their homosexual relationship caused. Rimbaud wreaked havoc throughout Paris, knocking the hats off priests in the street, verbally and physically assaulting the popular poets Verlaine introduced him to, and destroying Verlaine's marriage. The two ran away into the countryside together, then moved to London to live in abject poverty until Rimbaud, disgusted with Verlaine, who claimed he couldn't live without him, decided to leave. In desperation, Verlaine shot Rimbaud, wounding him in the wrist. The police came, and Verlaine was jailed for two years on charges not of assault, but sodomy. Meanwhile, Rimbaud escaped to his mother's farm, where he completed the body of poems that was to change poetry and writing itself forever. Then, at the age of 18, Rimbaud put down his pen and announced he was done with being a poet. 
He learned four more languages, German, Arabic, Russian, and Hindustani. He already knew French, English, and Latin, among others. And set off traveling. He crossed the Alps on foot, joined the Dutch colonial army, and deserted in the Indies. Joined a German circus touring Scandinavia, visited Egypt, and worked as a laborer in Cyprus. Throughout all these adventures, he was plagued by serious illness and health problems. But he never let them slow him down. At the age of 29, he became the first white man to journey to the Ogaden region of Ethiopia. And his report, pub published in the Proceedings of the Geographical Society, aroused interest in academic circles. Rimbad soon moved to Ethiopia as a gunrunner, and became close with the people there, living with a native woman and befriending the Ethiopian king. He received a letter from a famous poetry magazine in France begging him to return to lead the new literary movement that had grown up around his writings, but he didn't even bother to answer it. He didn't return to Europe until he developed a tumor in his right knee, which forced him to travel borne on a stretcher the thousands of miles back to France. There his leg was amputated and he languished in the care of his Christian mother and sister until at the edge of death. Exhausted beyond the bounds of even his love of life and truth, he made confession to a priest before expiring at the age of 36. Rimbaud knew better than to save any of himself for the grave. He spent every resource he had in his world down to the last penny. Burned money, health, friends, family, sanity as so much fuel for the fire. So when death came to take him away, he got nothing, not even a man with his pride or common sense intact. His life still stands in his, as an example to us all. The Domestication of Animals and of Man Perhaps you wonder sometimes if we're getting carried away with our criticism of modern-day life, if all the talk about the evil system and our sick society is just youthful rebelliousness and exaggeration. It certainly is hard to tell from here inside the human race, with all our disassembling and projecting and pretense, whether what we're doing really makes sense or not. So who knows? Maybe things aren't so fucked up, right? If you want some perspective on whether the brave New World Order really is as bad for us as some people say, just have a look at how it affects the others who must live in it, the animals. If you're middle class, the animals you know best, besides the ones in animated movies and commercials, are probably the ones who occupy the corresponding tier of the non-human hierarchy, the household pets, the zoo inmates and circus performers, the sports mascots and show horses. Just like the bourgeoisie, they seem to have it easy, sitting around all day, eating and sleeping, playing with their masters, but this is not the life these animals have been prepared for over the last million years of evolution. Dogs have four legs so they can run through fields and canyons and chase down prey, not play frisbee for an hour a week. Parrots have wings so they can fly over jungles and across wild landscapes, not just sit, wings cut away into little cages, with nothing to do to maintain their spirits, but sing to themselves and learn meaningless fragments of less musical languages. Cats have claws so they can fight and hunt and sharpen them anywhere they choose. They have testicles and ovaries so they can mark territory and go into heat and make love and raise kittens. Cut all these off and keep them locked inside and they get grouchy, pathetic, fat for lack of anything to do but eat standard issue canned food they can't even hunt. Domestic animals are expected to be the court jesters and courtesans of the modern household. To provide entertainment and surrogate community and their lives and even bodies are adjusted accordingly, the role is not to be animals and all the wondrous complexity that entails, but simply be toys. A quick look back at middle-class humans reveals how similar our situation is. We, too, live in isolation for our, from our fellows in small, climate-controlled boxes, little fish tanks complete with simulated foliage called apartments. We, too, are fed on standardized, mass-produced food that appears as, as if, out of nowhere, vastly different from our, the food our ancestors ate. We, too, have no outlet for our wild, spontaneous urges, sterilized and declawed by the necessities of living in cramped cities and suburbs under cramping legal and social and cultural conventions. We, too, cannot wander far from our kennels, leashed as we are by nine-to-five jobs, apartment leases, fences and property lines, and national borders. And just like our pets, we learn to behave, to be housebroken and spiritbroken, to adapt ourselves to this nightmare, becoming fat, grouchy, songless. Far less fortunate than our castrated prisoners, animal and human alike, are the animals that form the non-human pro proletariat, the chickens trapped living in their own shit in egg factories with their beaks removed so they won't peck out each other's eyes, the rabbits that have their eyes systematically burned out to test the safety of shampoo, the veal calves that spend their entire miserable existences in tiny wooden boxes. The roles these animals play correspond to those of factory workers, temporary dishwashers and secretaries, minimum wage movie theater popcorn servers, and however individual bosses might see things, you can bet the market views them all with the same calculating disinterest. 
the same profit-hungry heartlessness that makes it possible for the meat industry to regard the yearly holocaust of millions of animals as fine and just keeps them doing their best to fight off demands for better working conditions and higher wages. And just as cows and chickens have been carefully bred, even genetically engineered, to such an extent that they are unable to survive outside their cages, the modern worker no longer has any concept of what life outside the working world of plastic and concrete might be, or how to apply his energies except under a whip. Where would he go, anyway, where would he escape? Are there habitable lands as yet unclaimed to which he could flee? And wouldn't he destroy these lands, too, bringing to them the values of domination with which he has been poisoned by his bosses? In the end, unless advised by a total rejection of industrial capitalism, his flight would be just another advance in the tide of concrete that is sweeping across the globe. Finally, there are the wild animals which still survive in environments polluted with oil slicks, discarded plastic soda bottles, and air pollution, to say nothing of highways and hunters. As urbanization and suburbanization march pitilessly forward, destroying the resources of their natural habitats, they learn to live off human waste instead, or perish. Pigeons build nests out of cigarette butts instead of twigs. Rats learn to live in sewers and adapt accordingly. Cockroaches proliferate as the vultures of a new era. These urban wild animals occupy the same tier of society as the homeless do, scrounging through the refuse for the bare essentials of life, although they certainly fare better than their human counterparts. The suburban ones, the wily raccoons, possums, squirrels, who survive in the forgotten corners of conquered lands, living off what's left of the natural, not to mention the extras or excesses of the bourgeoisie, can be compared to squatters, organic farmers, punks, and metropolitan hunter-gatherers of the underground resistance. The remaining species of truly wild animals, like dolphins, caribou, and penguins, are analogous to the very, very few existing indigenous people of the world who have not yet lost all their culture or been placed in zoos. For all of them, the future looks bleak as the iron wind of standardization blows across this planet. This is not to say that we've deviated from some great plan set out for us by Mother Nature, or that the measure of happiness and health should be our conformity to the natural. Whenever human beings try to describe what nature is, they invariably project onto it the laws their own societies abide by, or ascribe to it everything they think their civilization lacks. And besides, nature itself is something that changes constantly. At this point, the natural habitat of a poodle really is a leash in a kennel. If we have destroyed the, the natural world with our civilization, then the final analysis this must too have been part of our natural destiny. For what is there that does not proceed ultimately from nature? Is humanity somehow blessed or cursed with powers that are supernatural? The question is not how to get back into submission to the, na into the natural, but rather to reintegrate ourselves into the world around us in a way that works. Can we make a world which is in which humans and animals can live in harmony with each other, with no divisions between them, no distinction between the natural and the civilized, between the familiar and the foreign? Can we escape from the forests of steel into the lush green ones that linger, atavistic, in our fantasies? F is for freedom. Freedom is a sensation. We have only choice. It's almost ludicrous to think of how many men and women have fought and died for the American idea of freedom, a man in a voting booth with a pencil, choosing which box to check. Real freedom, the kind of freedom we are fighting for, is something much grander. It means creating the choices you choose between, for starters. A better illustration is the musician in the act of playing with her companions. In joyous, seemingly effortless cooperation, they actively create the sonic and emotional environment in which they exist participating thus in the transformation of the world, which will in turn transform them. Take this model and extend it to every moment of our lives. Now that would be real freedom. Nothing is true. Everything is permitted. In the summer of 1999, Crime Think Special Agent Tristran Charazutha, who had eaten only garbage all year as a con consequence of his oath not to participate in, add fuel to, or encourage in any way the economy of world capitalism, was persuaded by one of his lovers to let her treat him to a dinner at an expensive Italian restaurant. In the months before this night, he had nearly starved to death, and living in a city with seductively packaged food leering from every shop window, he had been able to remain faithful to his vow only by constantly browbeating himself with the reminder that any compromise was a capitulation to the system that was starving millions of others. The experience of breaking this ban terrified him, because he wasn't ready for the overwhelming feeling of liberation that surged through him at the moment when he raised his fork. It felt as if the world should end, but it did not. Or rather, the whole world did end, and soundlessly, a new one began, unthinkable, unbearable, in its perfect resemblance to the old one. 
But now he was eating expensive polenta beside his bitter enemies as if it was nothing. The horrifying possibilities of this world opened again before him, like they had in his youth. The fact that anything could happen, that he could do anything, kill people, leaf off buildings, defy any self-regulation or expectation, and he realized with dread that his soul was rejoicing within him, heedless of the disapproval of his conscience. He leaped from his seat and dashed into the streets, and remained pacing them for many hours, agonizing over this rift within himself. At exactly two minutes after midnight, he had an epiphany and rushed home to write these notes. Freedom is to be found only in the sensation of acting, of self, and thus world creation, of the realization through practice the old saying, nothing is true, everything is permitted. Example, the revolutionary finds freedom in the experience of totally transforming society and thereby making himself, not simply in the removal of restrictive forces. To experience this, one must be capable of doing anything at any time. Remember the story of Achilles and the tortoise. The tortoise asks Achilles, are you free, Achilles? And Achilles responds, of course I am free. I am Achilles, a god among men, and free men at that. I can do anything I want. So, queries the tortoise, could you kill me? Easily, I am Achilles, the invulnerable. Not so, as it turned out, but anyway. Hero of Greek myth and legend, and you are a tortoise. So, kill me, challenges the tortoise, matter-of-factly. But you are my steadfast friend, my bosom companion, my comrade. I could never kill you, protests Achilles. Exactly, whispers the tortoise suggestively, and Achilles shudders. The moral is that in a situation where all meaning is already attributed, freedom is irrelevant. For all your possible actions are already determined. Freedom is to be found only in new spaces, in the brand new moments when fresh elements come into play and you have to create yourself from scratch. One must remain in practice if one is to be a revolutionary. One must constantly destroy and recreate the self, must push limits and break every rule and limitation. Thus, the un otherwise inexplicable affection so many freedom lovers have had for the Marquis de Sade, just as Jane E. wrote in her pamphlet on hypocrisy. The problem with all of this is that the exercise of total freedom is bound to conflict with your own desires. In addition to feeling the sensation of freedom from all constraints and having healthy food in my stomach, I also really do never desire to compromise with those motherfuckers never to treat any animal or dairy products as if they were food, never to give them my money or anyone else's. The answer to all of this, of course, is simply that we must create a world in which everything that is possible is also desirable, so that such a thing as sin will no longer even be conceivable and that there will be no reason for guilt, no possibility of hypocrisy or conflict between desires. In the utopia our revolution, mythically speaking now, should create, anything will be possible and good, for our hearts demand nothing less than total freedom. I shouldn't have to resist anything, any temptation. Therefore, I must make a world of temptation without shame. A world empty of meat and dairy products and fancy elitist bourgeois restaurants, for example. You can see in the very movements of their bodies, forced painfully into the narrow space of permitted masculinity, moving inside the invisible cage, how the supposed winners of the gender game suffer just as much as the others from their hollow victory. Constantly terrified of each other and everyone else, themselves most of all, they take their fear out on the rest of us, perpetuating the climate of fear and violence. But when the terrain of affection itself has been occupied, when every gesture has been appropriated by the language of coercion, how will we approach each other for support, for sanctuary, and for healing? Gender is another false division of life into arbitrary categories, none of which can adequately describe or contain any of us in order to define us against each other in the interest of power. There is no male, there is no female. Get free, get off the map. H is for history, hygiene, and hypocrisy. History, the dead hand of the past. Remember how differently time passed when you were 12 years old? One summer was a whole lifetime, and each day passed as a month does for you now. For everything was new. Each day held experiences and emotions that you had never encountered before, and by the time that summer was over, you had become a different person. Perhaps you felt a wild freedom then that has since deserted you. You felt as if anything could happen, as if your life could end up being virtually anything at all. Now, deeper into that life, it doesn't seem so unpredictable. The things that were once new and transforming have long since lost their freshness and danger, and the future ahead of you seems to have already been determined by your past. It is thus that each of us is dominated by history. The past lies upon us like a dead hand, 
guiding and controlling as if from the grave. At the time, it gives the individual a conception of herself, an identity. It piles weight upon her that she must fight to shake off if she is to remain light and free enough to continue reinventing herself. It is the same for the artist. Even the most challenging innovations eventually become crutches and cliches. Once an artist has come up with one good solution for a creative problem, it is hard for her to break free of it to conceive of other possible solutions. That is why most great artists can only offer a few really revolutionary ideas. They can become trapped by the very systems they create, just as these systems trap those who come after. It is hard to do something entirely new when one finds oneself up against a thousand years of painting history and tradition. And it is the same for the lover, for the mathematician, and the adventurer. For all, the past is an adversary to action in the present, an ever-increasing force of inertia that must be overcome. It is the same for the radical, too. Conventional wisdom has it that a knowledge of the past is indispensable in the pursuit of freedom and social change. But today's radical thinkers and activists are no closer to changing the world for their knowledge of past philosophies and struggles. On the contrary, they often seem mired in ancient methods and arguments, unable to comprehend what is needed in the present to make things happen. Their place in the tradition of struggle has trapped them in a losing battle, defending positions long useless and outmoded. Their constant references to the past not only render them incomprehensible to others, but also prevent them from re referencing what is going on around them. Let's consider what it is about history that makes it so paralyzing. In the case of world history, it is the exclusive, anti-subjective nature of the thing. History, with a capital H, is purportedly seen by the objective eye of science, as if from above. It demands that the individual value her impressions and experiences less than the official truth about the past. But it is not just official history that paralyzes us, it is the very idea of the past itself. Try thinking of the world as including all past and future time, as well as present space. An individual can at least hope to have some control over that part of the world which is in the future, but the past only acts on her. She can never act back upon it. If she thinks of the world, whether that world consists of her life or human history, as consisting mostly of future, proportionally speaking, she will see herself as fairly free to choose her own destiny and exert her will upon the world. But if her worldview replaces most of the world in the past, that puts her in a position of powerlessness. Not only is she unable to act upon or create most of the world in which she exists, but what future does remain is already largely predetermined by the effects of past events. Who, then, would want to be a meaningless fleck near the end of 8,000-year history of human civilization? Conceiving of the world in such a way can only result in feelings of futility and predetermination. We must think of the world differently to escape this trap. We must instead place ourselves and our present-day existence where they rightfully belong, in the center of our universe, and shake off the dead weight of the past. Time may well extend before and behind us infinitely, but it is not how we experience the world, and it is not how we must visualize it either if we want to find any meaning in it. If we dare to throw ourselves into the unknown and unpredictable, to continually seek out situations that force us to be in the present moment, we can break free of the feelings of inevitability and inertia that constrain our lives and, in those instants, step outside of history. What does it mean to step outside of history? It means, simply, to step into the present, to step into yourself. Time is compressed to the moment, space is concentrated to one point, and the unprecedented destiny of life is exhilarating. The rupture that occurs when you shake off everything that has come before is not just a break with the past. You are ripping yourself out of the past-future continuum you had built hurling yourself into a vacuum where anything can happen, and you are forced to remake yourself according to a new design. It is a sensation as terrifying as it is liberating, and nothing false or superfluous can survive it. Without such purges, life becomes so choked up with the dead and dry that it is nearly unlivable, as it is for us today. None of this is to say that we should condone the deliberate lies of those who would rewrite history with the intention of trapping us even deeper in ignorance and passivity than we are now. But the solution is not to combat their supposed objective truths with more claims to historical truth, for it is not more past we need to weigh upon us, but more attention to today. We must not allow them to make our lives and thoughts revolve around only what has been. Instead, we must realize that it is up to us to reveal what is true about the present and what is possible from here. So what can we embrace in place of history? Myth. Not the obscurest superstitions and holy lies of religion and capitalism, but the democratic myths of storytellers. Myths make no claims to par impartiality or objective truth. It is not to purport to offer an exhaustive explanation of the cosmos. Myth belongs to everyone, as it is made and remade by everyone, so it can never be used by one group to lord itself over another. 
and it does not paralyze. Instead of trapping people in the chains of cause and effect, myth makes them conscious of the enormous range of possibilities that their own lives have to offer. Instead of making them feel hopelessly small in a vast and uncaring universe, it centers the world again on their own experiences and ambitions, as represented by those of others. When we tell tales around the fire at night of heroes and heroines, of other struggles and adventures and societies, we are offering each other examples of just how much living is possible. The Power of Myth in Action, an Example To understand how myths work, let's take a look at the sub-counterculture of punk rock. Punk history doesn't need to be remembered, i.e. written down for everyone by the experts, for it is all present every time a punk band plays, and, drawing on a tradition longer than any of us could possibly remember, recaptures that ageless, timeless frenzy that makes punk rock matter in the first place. The facts and details of the past are absolutely irrelevant, and could not themselves enable any band to do this. The band must simply recognize the timeless, crucial element that made their predecessors' music matter, and learn from them that it cannot be caught the same way twice. All those punk history books just weigh you down and become obviously immaterial when a band is in front of you doing it. That passion you can still see in the wild abandon of the best punk bands is an ahistorical force, if anything is. It isn't something that can be explained in terms of history and tradition. What they are drawing on, above all, is a tradition of violating tradition, of breaking taboos in order to broaden the world. Thus, when it works, the myth of the punk band that destroys and liberates through music is not a restrictive platonic archetype, not a confining identity, but a model that enables action. There may be those who will threaten that the whole world will unravel if we stop concerning ourselves with the past and think only of the present. Let it unravel, then. A lot of good history has done us until now, repeating and repeating itself. Let's break out of it once and for all, before we too tread the circular path that our ancestors have worn so bare. Let's make the leap out of history, and make the moments of our daily lives the world we live in and care about. Only then can we make it into a place that has meaning for us. The present belongs to those who are able to seize it, to recognize all that it is and can be. How to Break the Chain of Events, Time Travel, and Other Banalities The world of real life, of the raw urgency of the moment, waits for us beneath history, its mysteries passed down through generations and the currency of experiences so intense they seem to transcend time itself. These experiences can be suppressed, discouraged, and denied by the clocks that tick at us from every side, but as long as we have hearts in our chests, we will find our ways to them again and again. History is haunted by its own karma, the moment of revolution, of real poetry, brings all its unsettled depths back into play, to be discharged forever so life can really begin. What we need now are instants so overwhelming, so irresistible, that the entire control system of regulated time melts beneath their scorching radiance. We adventurers should track these instants through this world as hunters track the most prized of prey. We want to live, to be here, now. A desire that goes beyond the present, past, future, atemporal, an instant that hangs in infinity like a single musical note, like our stories and scars that remain regardless of our second thoughts. Today I feel and exist forever against the clocks. Amen. Hygiene, washing, and brainwashing. Even in the most anti-establishment of underground circles, I'm amazed by how frequently I hear people complain about people they call hippies or crusty punks. These crusty punks came in here and smelled up the whole place, they'll say. What great transgression have these people committed to be so reviled? They have a different orientation to the question of cleanliness than the rest of us do. Where do our ideas and values about so-called cleanliness come from, anyway? Western civilization has a long history of associating cleanliness with goodness and merit, best summed up by the old expression, cleanliness is next to godliness. In ancient Greek plays, evil people and spirits, the Furies, for example, were often described as filthy. The Furies were dirty, aged, and female, exactly the opposite of how the playwright who described him, them saw himself. Their filthiness, among other things, identified them as an outgroup, as alien, animal, inhuman. Over time, cleanliness became a measure with which the have separated themselves from the have-nots. Those who possessed the wealth and power required to have the leisure to remain indoors, inactive, scorned the peasants and travelers whose lifestyles involved getting their hands and bodies dirty. Throughout history, we can see that cleanliness has been used as a standard of worth by those with power to ascribe social status. And thus, the godly, the self-proclaimed holy ones who stood above the rest of us in hierarchical society, proclaiming that their cleanliness, bought with the labor of others who were forced to work for them, was a measure of their godliness and superiority. To this day, we accept the traditional belief that being clean, according to social norms, is desirable in itself. 
It should be clear from the history of our idea ideas about cleanliness that anyone who is critical of mainstream values, any radical or punk rocker, should be extremely suspicious of the great value placed on being clean according to traditional standards. Besides, what exactly does clean mean? These days, cleanliness is defined by more corporations selling sanitation products than by anyone else. This is important to keep in mind. Certainly, most of these products have an uncanny ability to cut through natural dirt and grime. But does removing natural dirt and grime with synthetic chemicals necessarily constitute the only acceptable form of sanitation? I'm at least as frightened by these manufactured artificial products as I am of a little dust, mud, or sweat. Or, God forbid, a stain from food or blood on my shirt. At least I know where the filth came from and what it's made of. The idea that it is worthwhile to use chemicals, whether they be deodorant, detergent, or shampoo, to eradicate or organic dirt has some frightening implications, too. First, it supports the old Christian superstition that the biological body is shameful and should be hidden, that our bodies and our existence in the physical world as animals are intrinsically disgusting and sinful. This valuation has been used to keep us insecure and ashamed, and thus at the mercy of the priests and other authorities who tell us how to become pure, once by submitting to their holy denial of the self, and now by spending plenty of money on the various sanitation products they want to sell us. Also, as capitalism transforms the entire world from the organic, forests, swamps, deserts, rivers, to the inorganic, cities of concrete and steel, suburbs of asphalt and astroturf, wastelands that have been stripped of all natural resources, garbage dumps. The idea that there is something more worthwhile about synthetic chemicals than natural dirt implies that this transformation might actually be a good thing, and thus implicitly justifies their profit-motivated destruction of our planet. In reality, these corporations are far less concerned with our health and cleanliness than they are with selling us their products. They use the high value we place on sanitation to sell us all sorts of products in its name. And who knows what the real long-term health effects of these products are? They certainly don't care. If we do eventually get sick from using their special cleansers and high-tech shampoos, they can just sell us another product, medicine, and keep the wheels of the capitalist econo economy turning. And the shame about our bodies, as producers of sweat and other natural fluids, which we deem dirty, that they capitalize on and encourage, also aids them in selling us other products which depend upon our insecurity. Diet products, exercise products, fashionable clothes, etc. When we accept their definition of cleanliness, we are accepting their economic domination of our lives. Even if they agree about the questionable nature of today's sanitation products, most people today would still argue that sanitation is still healthier than filth. To some extent, this is true. It probably is a good idea to wash your feet if you step in shit. But aside from obvious cases like that, there are a thousand different standards of which it is clean and what is dirty across the world. If you look at different societies and civilizations, you will come across health practices that seem suicidal by our sanitation standards. And yet, these people survived as well as we do. People in Africa a few hundred years ago lived comfortably in a natural environment that destroyed many of the very prim and polished Western explorers that came to their continent. Human beings can adapt to a wide variety of environments and situations, and it seems that the question of what kinds of sanitation are healthy is at least as much a question of convention as of hard-set biological rules. Try violating a few of the common sense rules of Western sanitation sometimes. You'll find that eating out of garbage cans and going a few weeks without a shower aren't really as dangerous or difficult as we were taught. Perhaps the most important question when it comes to the unusual value we place on traditional cleanliness is what we lose by doing this. Once, before we covered up our natural scents with chemicals, each of us had a unique smell. These scents attracted us to each other and bound us emotionally to each other through memory and association. Now, if you have positive as associations with the scent of the man you love, it is probably his cologne, identical to the cologne of thousands of other men that you enjoy, not his own personal scent. And the natural pheromones with which we once communicated with each other, which played such an important role in our sexuality, are now completely smothered by standardized chemical products. We no longer know what it is like to be pure, natural human beings, to smell like real human beings. Who knows how much we may have lost because of this? Those who find me disgusting for enjoying the scent and taste of my lover when she hasn't showered or rum synthetics all over herself, when she smells like a real human being, are probably the same ones who shudder at the idea of digging a vegetable out of the ground and eating it instead of the plastic wrap, man-made fast food that we have all been brought up on. We have become so accustomed to our domesticated, engineered existence that we don't even know what we're missing. So try to be a little more open-minded when it comes to the crusties. Perhaps they just smell bad to you because you've never gotten a chance to discover what a real human being smells like. Perhaps there is something worthwhile about being unwashed that you ha haven't noticed it before. The moral of the story is the moral of all anarchist stories, except only the rules and values which really make sense to you. Figure out what's right for you, and don't let anybody tell you different. But also, 
make an effort to understand where others are coming from and evaluate their actions by your own standards, not according to some standardized norm. Today, it is impossible to avoid hypocrisy in any struggle against the status quo. The political and economic structures are constructed so that it is practically impossible to avoid being implicated in their workings. Today, whatever a man thinks of the employment opportunities available to him or of our economic system itself, he has almost no choice except to work if he does not want to starve to death or die of an illness for which he could not afford health care. If he does not believe in material property, he still has no choice but to buy all the food and clothing he needs and to buy or rent living space, that is, if he is not ready to live at odds with the legal system. For there is no free land left that has not been claimed by someone, almost no food or other resources anywhere that are not someone's property. If a woman wants to distribute material criticizing the capitalist system of production and consumption, she still has no way to produce and distribute this material without paying to produce it and selling it to consumers, or at least selling advertising, which encourages people to be consumers, to finance production. If a woman does not want to, f to finance the brutal torture and slaughter of animals in the name of capitalism, she can stop eating meat and dairy products, stop purchasing health products which were tested on animals, and stop wearing leather and fur. But there are still animal products in the films, in her camera, and movies she watches, in the vinyl records she listens to, in countless other products which she will be hard-pressed to do without in a modern society. Besides, the companies she buys her vegetables from are most likely connected to the companies who make meat and dairy products, so her money goes to the same ends. And these vegetables themselves were probably picked by migrant workers or other oppressed labor. For the average man who is unready to uproot his life completely and risk death in complete ostracism, keeping his hands clean of the nightmare around him is an impossible dream. Even if you radically reject and disconnect yourself from every one of these institutions and survive by the means of theft or transgression alone, you are still playing a role in the status quo. The system is a vast, organic entity that includes everything within its boundaries, even the recluses who free from it and the terrorists who die fighting it. To fight it is always to fight it from within, for it creates us and molds us even when it directs us against itself. To claim to be outside it for even an instant, living as we do in a world that is made up in almost entirely of human constructs, whether physical, social, or f philosophical, is worse than madness. It is a misplaced fanaticism of a decidedly Christian bent. Most Western values are so deeply ingrained in our minds that it is practically impossible to avoid being influenced in our actions by the very assumptions and attitudes we are struggling against. After a lifetime of being taught to place a financial value on the hours of our lives, it is hard to stop feeling like one must be rewarded materially for an activity for it to be worthwhile. After a lifetime of being taught to respect hierarchies of authority, it is very difficult to suddenly interact with all human beings as equals, let alone have sex with them without eroticizing domination and submission. After a lifetime of being taught to associate happiness with passive spectatorship, it is hard to enjoy building furniture more than watching television. And of course, there are 10,000 more subtle ways in which these values and assumptions manifest themselves in our thoughts and our actions. This does not mean that resistance is futile. Indeed, if our choices today are so limited that we cannot act without replicating the conditions from which we are trying to escape, resistance is all the more crucial. This does mean that innocence is a myth, a counter-revolutionary concept which we must leave behind us with the rest of post-Christian thinking. The traditional Christian demand upon human beings is that they be innocent, that they keep their hands clean of any sin. At the same time, sin is so difficult for any Christian to avoid, as counter-revolutionary activity is today for us, that this demand leads to feelings of guilt, failure, and ultimately despair when he realizes that it is impossible for him to be innocent and pure. In fact, by forbidding sin, Christian doctrine makes it all, more, all the more tempting and intriguing for the believer. For whether the mind does or not, the human heart recognizes no authority and will always seek out that which is forbidden. We must not make the same mistakes as the Christians. The demand that radicals be free from hypocrisy, free from any implication in the system, has the same effects as the Christian demand that people be free from sin. It creates frustration and despair in those who would seek change, and at the same time makes hypocrisy all the more tempting. Rather than seek to have clean hands, we should aim to make the inevitable negative effects of our lives worthwhile by offering enough positive activity to more than balance the scales. This approach to the problem can save us from being immobilized by fear of hypocrisy or shame about our guilt. Besides, demands that we avoid hypocrisy deny the complexity of the human soul. The human heart is not simple. Every human being has a variety of desires which pull her in different directions. To ask that she only pursue some desires and always ignore others is to demand that she remain perpetually unfulfilled and curious. This is typical of the kind of dogmatic, ideological thinking that has afflicted us for centuries, and insists that the individual must be loyal to one set of rules and only one, rather than doing what is appropriate for her needs in a particular situation. 
It might be well true that the whole self can only be expressed in hypocrisy. Certainly a person needs to formulate a general set of guidelines regarding the decisions she will make, but to break from these occasionally prevents stagnation and offers the opportunity to consider whether the guidelines need re-evaluation. A person who is not afraid to be hypocritical from time to time is in less danger of selling out permanently one day, because she is able to taste the forbidden fruit without feeling forced to make a permanent choice. She is immune to the shame and eventual despair that afflict those who strive for perfect innocence. So be proud of yourself as you are. Don't try to get the inconsistencies of your soul to match up in a false and forced manner, or it will only come back to haunt you. Rather than holding inflexibility to a set system, let us dare to reject the idea that we must be faithful to any particular doctrine in our efforts to create a better life for ourselves. Let us not claim to be innocent. Let us not claim to be pure or right. But let us proclaim loudly that we are all hypocrites, that we will stop at nothing, not even hypocrisy, in our struggle to take control of our lives. In this age when it is impossible to avoid being a part of a system we strive against, only blatant hypocrisy is truly subversive, for it alone speaks the truth about our hearts, and it alone can show just how difficult it is to avoid living the modern life which has been prepared for us, and that alone is a good reason to fight. Exhibit A. Crime Think Itself the Crime Think Collective is a perfect example of the difficulties a subversive organization will encounter in seeking to avoid hypocrisy and of the liberating possibilities that embracing hypocrisy can create. Our tabloid harbinger exists to criticize such modern phenomenon as advertising, which is fundamentally an effort on the part of modern businesses to persuade people to purchase their products whether or not this is in their best interest. And yet Crime Think must sell advertising in the pages of Harbinger in order to finance its publication, at least when the proceeds from stolen cars are not enough. Harbinger exists to warn against those who would sell ideologies that prescribe certain kinds of thinking and acting, whether or not these manners of thinking and acting are in the best interest of human beings. And yet, in order to compete with these forces, Crime Think too must sell an ideology of sorts, an ideology of thinking for yourself, but an ideology all the same. Certainly we may claim that our products, our ideologies, really are in the best interest of human beings, but isn't that what every corporation and political party claims? In this case, and a thousand others, it is impossible for us in crime think to pursue the goals we seek without simultaneously betraying those goals. Just as we strive to fight against the system, we replicate it. Selling revolutionary ideas is still selling ideas. And as long as buying and selling are taking place, nothing truly revolutionary is happening. Indeed, the fact that revolutionary ideas are being used to perpetuate the status quo means that whatever resistance there might be is neutralized and assimilated from the start. On the other hand, activity is better than inactivity, and perhaps the efforts that we make here will still be able to have positive effects, and hopefully our willingness to point out where we are compromised will prevent those compromises from rendering our efforts useless. It might be possible to incite genuine change in the lives of human beings, despite the implication inherent in any kind of activity today. It's worth a try. Of course, perhaps this sort of idealism will only serve to trick us, with the best of all possible intentions, into betraying the very ideals which we seek to promote. Perhaps we are sealing our own fate by transforming whatever genuine ideas for change people may have into ultimately ineffectual activities, such as purchasing revolutionary products and discussing the ideas of others. Perhaps the advertising we sell in Harbinger will only lead people to purchase the products advertised and thus be forced to remain trapped in the wage slavery system, rather than harmlessly raising the funds necessary to publish our demand for the end of the system. Or maybe this hypocrisy is merely a cover that allows us to go about our business of revolution without appearing to be much of a threat by making us appear to be another innocuous pseudo-revolutionary group. Perhaps we only appear to be hopelessly compromised, so the forces that have a stake in the status quo will not recognize the threat that we do pose, until it is too late. Or it might even be that crime think is actually orchestrated by those very forces, to lead those who do desire change astray into expanding their efforts uselessly. Even then, it might have unforeseen effects. Who can tell for sure? The thing is to act, to act joyously, not to accept that we are helpless to effect change. For if we seek to resist the roles and lives set forward for us, if we fight a spirited fight against the forces that would keep us in despair, if we dare to act on our own and to act passionately and freely, that itself is revolution. I is for identity, ideology, and image. Us versus them, the eternal myth and paradox, adapted from Stella and Nera's journals. 1. Identity and the Scarcity Economics of Self after we met Alec, Jackson remarked, When I meet a person, I don't like it if he immediately starts talking shit about other people. I don't want to hear about which groups he is against, but what he is doing himself. Well, Jackson, I think in his own crippled way, Alex was trying to tell you what he's doing. What he's doing is simply being against the cliques he was talking about. 
Perhaps he has no notion of how to do anything more positive than to take an opposing stance. He's certainly not the only one. Competitive human relations depend on and perpetuate a feeling of impoverishment in the individual, a scarcity economics of the soul. For in the status quo, she is unable to do what she wants, and at the same time, she must feel this helplessness and poverty of life to be willing to play instead of the loser's game of powers. To assuage this feeling of impoverishment, the individual seeks, more than mere physical possessions, which are just a mean to this end, identity, the consolation for lack of freedom. If I can't, at least I am. Identity, as a concept, works in terms of contrast. One is a fill-in-the-blank, as opposed to the others who are not. Thus, to the desperate lost soul of modern society, nothing is more precious than opponents, people to despise, so he can reassure himself of his own worth as a faithful patron of Brandeck's ideology, for example. The young activist, though heretofore unaware of it, has quite a stake in maintaining the alienation of others, and it should not be surprising when he acts superior, threatening, etc., in order to maintain the distance between himself and the normal people. To be effective at acting radically, rather than just acting radical, one must be disinterested in being radical or an activist, but only desire to help make radical things happen. So no more stupid conflicts and infighting, for heaven's sake. In a system which is conflict systemized as social relations, in which society is a network of struggles arranged as social structure, getting along is practically the definition of the radical act. Until we are able to leave our identities behind, whenever we come together, it will merely be a case of images meeting and clashing, with the humans behind them unable even to see each other. 2. Fight war and wars this being the case, we can't spend all our energy on our efforts simply to defeat the state, corporate tyranny, etc. For even if we do succeed, as long as most people are unable to work together, and thus unaware of their own potential, we can only be another vanguard slash ruling party. Under such conditions, the struggle with the state is just another power struggle substitute for free action. We need to strive simultaneously for freedom from external constraints, and for the strength to love and forgive and cooperate. And for this project, we absolutely must be ready to shake off our need for identity in the traditional sense. What we need most now are ways to speak that can give others voices of their own, contrary to the aforementioned social scarcity economics, in which the very act of speaking monopolizes expression and denies it to others. Ways to act that can activate. These will be the weapons no power can defeat. What is needed above all, then, is the self-confidence to talk with and listen to others, to find magic tricks by which old conflicts can be superseded and people like Alec and his rival factions discover ways to coexist and support each other. For revolution is not making everyone the same in their ideologies or relations with each other, but simply establishing mutually beneficial relations between different individuals and groups. I would do better myself to think about how Alec and I can transcend our predictable interactions instead of just analyzing him in a way that makes me feel so much smarter and more mature. Editor's Introduction Possibly the best text any of us have written on this subject is a letter Nadia once sent to a friend in response to an article he had written with her help. Her original title for the piece had been The Political Struggle is the Struggle Against the Political, which he changed to Against the Shallowness of the Political. So here is her letter reprinted from his private collection. Remember, whatever you believe imprisons you. Dearest E, no, you haven't understood what I'm talking about at all. In your hurry to purchase for yourself the image of political activist, or worse, theorist, whatever that is, you've concluded that everything must be political, whatever that is. For the farther you expand the meaning of any word, the blurrier it becomes and the more useless. Once everything is political, then political means nothing all over again, and we have to start from scratch. So, assuming political isn't just a meaningless all-purpose word, of course, there are political ways to look at every issue, including one's own mortality. I wasn't trying to deny that. That, in fact, is exactly my point. Once you begin to think of yourself as political, once you start to think in terms of analysis and critique, worse yet, to think of yourself as having a critique, you come to approach everything on those terms. You try to fit everything into your analysis. Being political becomes a cancer that spreads slowly to every corner of your being, until you can't think about anything except in terms of class struggle or gender or whatever. And there is no analysis, no ideology, because that's what we're talking about here, with your insistence on the politics of living and the theory of politics, broad enough to capture everything that life is. An ideology, just like an image, is always something you have to purchase. That is, 
you must give up a part of yourself in return for it. That part of yourself is every aspect of the world, every deliciously complex experience, every irreducible detail that won't fit into your framework you so proudly constructed. Sure, you can look at oral sucks and sunsets and love songs and really good Chinese food in terms of political issues, or even approach them in a way that is political in a far less superficial sense. But the fact is that when you're there in those moments, there are things that can escape any kind of comprehension, let alone expression, let alone analysis. Living and feeling are simply too complicated to be captured completely by any language or any combination of languages. Just like that fucking half-wit Plato, the casualty of ideology, which I'm begging you not to be, comes to doubt the reality of anything he can't symbolize with language, political or otherwise, because he for he's forgotten that his symbols are only convenient generalizations to stand in place of the innumerable unique moments that make up the universe. I can anticipate your response. My critique of the political is itself a political evaluation, a part of my ideology. And so it is. I write to you so vehemently about this because it's an issue I'm really struggling with right now. I find myself turning everything into a political tract or critique possessed by what my ideology described as a capitalistic compulsion to transform all of my feelings and experiences into objects, that is, into theories I can carry around with me. My values have come to revolve around those theories, which I show off as proof of my intelligence and importance, the same way a bourgeois man shows off his car as proof of his worth. My life isn't about my actual experience anymore. It's about the struggle. When I'd wanted that struggle to be about centering my life on my experiences, not some new substitute. I'd like to say this letter is my last stand against the all-consuming demands of the political, but that was probably long ago, the last time I was able to reflect on something without the political ramifications even occurring to me. Careful what you wish for, E, when you say everything is political. I think part of this pathological need to systematize everything comes from living in cities, incidentally. Every single thing around us here has been made by human beings and has specific human meaning attached to it. So when you look around, instead of seeing the actual objects that are around you, you see a forest of symbols. When I was staying in the mountains, it was different. I would go walking, and I wouldn't see don't walk signs. I would see trees and flowers, things that have an existence beyond any framework of human meaning and values. Standing under a starry sky, there, gazing at the silent horizon, the world felt so immense and profound that I could only stand before it mute and trembling. No politics could ever provide a vessel deep enough to hold those moments. Not to say there's no reason for us to conceptualize things, E, because of course that's useful sometimes. But it's a means, and not the only means, to a much greater end. That's all. I'll leave you with this, my own poor translation of a line from the farewell letter Mao Tzu Zing's mistress wrote him, shortly after the so-called success of the Chinese so-called communist revolution. It's sadly predictable that the only way you can come up with to celebrate the liberation you feel at leaving the old system behind is by coming up with a system of liberation, as if such a thing could exist. But that's what we can expect from those who have never known anything other than systems and systematizing, I guess. With your love, Nadia. Image seduced by the image of reality. When I would look through magazines as a small child, I used to think that there must be a magical world somewhere where everything looked and was perfect. I could see pictures from it in those pages, the smoky air of dimly lit rooms heavy with drama as the young models lounged in designer fashions. That is where excitement and adventure is to be found, I thought, in the world where every room is flawlessly decorated and every woman's wardrobe is picked and matched with daring and finesse. I resolved to have an adventurous life of my own and began looking for those rooms and women right away. And though I've discovered since then that romance and excitement rarely come hand in hand with the images of them that are presented to us, usually the opposite is true, that adventure is to be found precisely where there is no time or energy for keeping up appearances. I still catch myself sometimes thinking that everything would be perfect if I only lived in that picturesque log cabin with matching rugs. Whatever each of us may be looking for, we all tend to pursue our own desires by pursuing images. Symbols of the thing we desire. We buy leather jackets when we want rebellion in danger. We purchase fast cars not for the sake of driving at high velocities, but to recapture our lost youth. When we want to live in a different world, we buy political pamphlets and bumper stickers. Somehow, we assume that having all the right accessories will get us the perfect lives. And as we construct our lives, we tend to do it according to an image, a pattern that has been laid out before us. Hippie, businessman, housewife, punk. Why do we think so much about images today, rather than concentrating on reality, on our lives and emotions themselves? 
One of the reasons that images have attained so much significance in this society is that, unlike activities, images are easy to sell. Advertising and marketing, which are designed to invest products with a symbolic value that will attract customers, have transformed our culture. Corporations have been spreading propaganda designed to make us believe in the magic powers of their commodities for generations now. Deodorants offer popularity, soda offers youth and energy, jeans offer sex appeal. At our jobs, we exchange our time, energy, and creativity for the ability to buy these symbols, and we keep buying them, for of course no quantity of cigarettes can really give anyone sophistication. Rather than satisfying our needs, these products multiply them. For to get them, we must sell our lives away. We keep going back, not knowing another way, hoping that the new product, self-help books, punk rock records, that vacation cabin with matching rugs, will be the one that will fix everything. We are easily persuaded to chase these images because it's simply easier to change the scenery around you than it is to change your own life. How much less trouble, how much less risky it would be if you could make your life perfect just by collecting all the right accessories. No participation necessary. The image comes to embody all the things you desire, and you spend all your time and energy trying to get the details right. The bohemian tries to find the perfect black beret and the right poetry readings to attend. The frat boy has to be seen with the right friends, at the right parties, drinking the right beers, and wearing the right informal dress shirts, rather than pursuing the desires themselves. For it is easier to identify yourself with a prefabricated image than to identify exactly what you want in life. But if you really want adventure, an Australian hunting jacket won't suffice. And if you really want romance, dinner and a movie with the most popular girl at your school might not be enough. Fascinated as we are by images, our values have come to revolve around a world we can never actually experience. There's no way into the pages of the magazine. There's no way to be the archetypical punk or the perfect executive. We're trapped out here in the real world forever. And yet we keep looking for life in pictures, in fashions, in spectacles of all kinds, and anything we can collect or watch instead of doing. We look for life in the image of life. Watching from the sidelines. The curious thing about a spectacle is how it immobilizes the spectators. Just like the image, it centers their attention, their values, and ultimately their lives around something outside of themselves. It keeps them occupied without making them active. It keeps them feeling involved without giving them control. You can probably think of a thousand different examples of this. Television programs, action movies, magazines that give updates on the lives of celebrities and superstars, spectator sports, representative democracy, the Catholic Church. A spectacle also isolates the people whose attention it commands. Many of us know more about the fictitious character of popular sitcoms than we know about the lives and loves of our neighbors. For even when we talk to them, it is about television shows, the news, and the weather. Thus, the very experiences and information that we share in common as spectators of the mass media serve to separate us from one another. It is the same at a football game. Everybody watching from the bleachers is a nobody, regardless of who they are. They may be sitting next to each other, but all eyes are focused on the field. If they speak to each other, it is almost never about each other, but about the game that is being played before them. And although football fans cannot participate in the events of the game they are watching, or exert any real influence over them, they attach the utmost importance to these events and associate their own needs and desires with the outcome in a most unusual way. Rather than concentrating their attention on things that have a real bearing on their desires, they reconstruct their desires to revolve around the things they pay attention to. Their language even conflates the achievements of the team they identify themselves with, with their own actions. We scored a goal. We won, shout the fans from their seats and sofas. This stands in stark contrast to the way people speak about the things that go on in their own cities and communities. They're building a new highway, we say about the new changes in our neighborhood. What will they think of next, we say about the latest advances in scientific technology. Our language reveals that we think of ourselves as spectators in our own societies. But it's not they, the mysterious other people, who have made the world the way it is. It is we, humanity ourselves. No small team of scientists, city planners, and rich bureaucrats could have done all the working and inventing and organizing that it has taken for us to transform this planet. It has taken and still takes all of us working together to do this. We are the ones doing it every day. And yet most of us seem to feel that we can have more control over football games than we can over our own cities, our jobs, even our own lives. We might have more success in our pursuit of happiness if we start really trying to participate. Instead of accepting the role of passive spectator sports, society, and life, it is up to each of us to figure out how to play an active and significant part in creating the worlds around us and within us. Perhaps one day we can build a new society in which we all will be involved together in the decisions that affect the lives we lead. Then we will be able to truly choose our own destinies. 
What's the point of doing anything if nobody's watching? We all want to be famous, to be seen, frozen, preserved in the media, because we've come to trust what is seen more than what is actually lived. Somehow we've gotten everything backwards, and image seems more real to us than experience. To know that we really exist, that we really matter, we have to see ghosts of ourselves preser preserved in photographs, on television shows and videotapes, in the public eye. And when you go on vacation, what do you see? Scores of tourists with video cameras screwed to their faces, as if they're trying to suck all of the real world into the two-dimensional world of images, spending their time off seeing the world through a tiny glass lens. Sure, turning everything that you could experience with all five senses into recorded information that you can only observe from a distance, detached, offers you the illusion of having control of your life. You can rewind and replay them over and over until everything looks ridiculous. But what kind of life is that? What's the point of watching anything if nobody's doing? L is for love. Join the resistance. Fall in love. Falling in love is the ultimate act of revolution, of resistance to today's tedious, socially restrictive, culturally constrictive, patently ridiculous world. Love transforms the world. Where the lover formerly felt boredom, he now feels passion. Where she once was complacent, she now is excited and compelled to self-asserting action. The world which once seemed empty and tiresome becomes filled with meaning, filled with risks and rewards, with majesty and danger. Life for the lover is a gift, an adventure with the highest possible stakes. Every moment is memorable, heartbreaking, in its fleeting beauty. When he falls in love, a man who once felt disoriented, alienated, and confused finally knows exactly what he wants. Suddenly, his existence makes sense to him. It becomes valuable, even glorious and noble. Burning passion is an antidote that will kill the worst cases of despair and resignation. Love makes it possible for individuals to connect to others in a meaningful way. It impels them to leave their shells and risk being honest and spontaneous together, to come to know each other in profound ways. Thus, love makes it possible for us to care about each other genuinely, rather than at the end of the gun of Christian doctrine. But at the same time, it plucks the lover out of the routines of everyday life and separates her from other human beings. She feels a million miles away from the herd of humanity, living as she is in a world entirely different from theirs. In this sense, love is subversive because it poses a threat to the established order of our modern lives. The boring rituals of workday productivity and socialized etiquette no longer mean anything to a man who has fallen in love, for there are more important forces guiding him than mere inertia and deference to a tradition. Marketing strategies that depend on apathy or insecurity have no effect upon him. Entertainment designed for passive consumption, which depends on exhaustion or cynicism, can no longer interest him. There is no place for the passionate romantic lover in today's world, business or private, for he can see that it might be worthwhile to hitchhike to Alaska or to sit in the park and watch the clouds sail by with his sweetheart than to study for his calculus exam or sell real estate. And if he decides that it is, he will have the courage to do it rather than being tormented by unsatisfied longing. He knows that breaking into a cemetery and making love under the stars will make for a more memorable night than watching television ever could. So love poses a threat to the consumer-driven economy, which depends upon consumption of largely useless products and the labor that this consumption necessitates to perpetuate itself. Similarly, love poses a threat to our political system, for it is difficult to convince a man who has a lot to live for in his personal relationships to be willing to fight and die for an abstraction such as the state. For that matter, it may be difficult to convince him even to pay taxes. It poses a threat to cultures of all kinds, for when human beings are given wisdom and valor by true love, they will not be held back by traditions or customs which are irrelevant to the feelings that guide them. Love even poses a threat to our society it itself. Passionate love is ignored and feared by the bourgeoisie, for it poses a great danger to the stability and pretense they covet. Love permits no lies, no falsehoods, not even polite half-truths, but lays all emotions bare and it reveals secrets which domesticated men and women cannot bear. You cannot lie with your emotional and sexual response. Situations or ideas that excite or repel you, whether you like it or not, whether it is polite or not, whether it is advisable or not. One cannot be a lover and a dreadfully responsible, dreadfully respectable member of today's society at the same time, for love impels you to do things which are not responsible or respectable. True love is irresponsible, irrespectable, rebellious, scornful of cowardice, dangerous to the lover and everyone around her, for it serves one master alone, the passion that makes the heart beat faster. It disdains anything else, be it self-preservation, duty, or shame. Love urges men and women to heroism and to anti-heroism, to indefensible acts that need no defense. For the lover speaks a different moral and emotional language than, t than the typical bourgeoisie man does. The average bourgeoisie man has no overwhelming, smoldering desires. 
Sadly, all he knows is the silent despair that comes from spending his life pursuing goals set for him by his family, his educators, his employers, his nation, and his culture, without ever being able to consider what needs and wants he might have of his own. Without the burning fire of desire to guide him, he has no criteria upon which to choose what is right and wrong for himself. Consequently, he is forced to adopt some dogma or doctrine to direct him through his life. There are a wide variety of moralities to choose from in the marketplace of ideas, but which morality a man buys into is immaterial so long as he chooses one because he is at a loss otherwise as to what he should do with himself and his life. How many men and women, having never realized that they had the option to choose their own des destinies, wander through life in a dull haze, thinking and acting in accordance with the laws that have been taught to them, merely because they no longer have any other idea what to do? But the lover needs no prefabricated principles to direct her. Her desires identify what is right and wrong for her, for her heart guides her through life. She sees beauty and meaning in the world because her desires paint the world in these colors. She has no need for dogmas, for moral systems, for commandments and imperatives, for she knows what to do without instructions. Thus she does indeed pose quite a threat to our society. What if everyone decided right and wrong for themselves without any regard for conventional morality? What if everyone did what they wanted to with the courage to face any consequences? What if everyone feared loveless, lifeless monotony more than fearing to take risks, more than they fear of being hungry or cold in danger? What if everyone set down their responsibilities and common sense and dared to pursue their wildest dreams, to set the stakes high and live each day as if it were the last? Think what a place the world would be. Certainly it would be different than it is now, and it is quite a truism that people from the mainstream, the simultaneous keepers and victims of the status quo, fear change. And so, despite the stereotyped images used in the media to sell toothpaste and honeymoon sweets, genuine passionate love is discouraged in our culture. Being carried away by your emotions is frowned upon. Instead, we are raised to always be on our guard, lest our hearts lead us astray. Rather than being encouraged to have the courage to face the consequences of risks taken in pursuit of our heart's desires, we are counseled not to take risks at all, to be responsible. And love itself is regulated. Men must not fall in love with other men, nor women with other women, nor individuals from different ethnic backgrounds with each other, or else the usual bigots who form the frontline offensive in the assault of modern Western culture upon the individual will step in. Men and women who have already entered into a legal religious contract are not to fall in love with anyone else, even if they no longer feel any passion for their marital partners. Love, as most of us know it today, is a carefully prescribed and preordained ritual, something that happens on Friday nights in expensive movie theaters and restaurants, something that fills the pockets of the shareholders in the entertainment industries without preventing workers from showing up at the office on time and ready to reroute phone calls all day long. This regulated commercial love is nothing like the burning fire that consumes the genuine lover. Restrictions, expectations, and regulations smother true love. For love is a wildflower that can never grow within the confines prepared for it, but only appears when it is least expected. We must fight against these cultural restraints that would cripple and smother our desires. For it is love that gives meaning to life, desire that makes it possible for us to make sense of our existence and find purpose in our lives. Without these, there is no way for us to determine how to live our lives, except to submit to some authority, to some god, master, or doctrine that will tell us what to do and how to do it without ever giving us the satisfaction that self-determination does. So fall in love today with men, with women, with music, with ambition, with yourself, with life. Postscript. One might say that it is ridiculous to implore others to fall in love. One either falls in love or one does not. It is not a choice that can be made consciously. Emotions do not follow the instructions of the rational mind but the environment in which we must live out our lives has a great influence on our emotions and we can make decisions that affect this environment. It should be possible to work to change an environment that is hostile to love into an environment that encourages it. Our task must be to engineer our worlds, that it is a world in which people can and do fall in love, and thus to reconstitute human beings so that we will be ready for the revolution spoken of in these pages, so that we will be able to find meaning and happiness in our lives. M is for their media, movement, and myth. If you beat them at their own game, you've lost. So, you're in a band with a really important message, and you want to get it out to as many people as possible. So you're trying to get really popular and sell lots and lots of records. Or perhaps you're a political activist, and you think that it's necessary to use the mainstream media to educate people about certain issues. It seems to make sense that you should use these methods to reach people, because otherwise, who will notice you? Yes, you realize that you're making compromises with the very system you're trying to fight, 
but it'll be worth it in the end, and we all have to make compromises, don't we? It's worth considering whether we do after all, just as it's worth questioning whether getting ahead in the system of cut-through competition and mass marketing can ever really help us change the world. So what would happen if we stopped compromising, stopped playing their game altogether, and concentrated all our efforts on creating channels of our own for spreading ideas in new ways? The revolution cannot be televised. Of course they want you on their television show, radio program, rock festival, major label. They don't care whether they're selling mouthwash or anarchist revolution as long as they keep people watching and buying. They know that sooner or later people are bound to get bored and fed up with the mindless, passionless dribble that they normally have to offer, and they count on you to keep new ideas and styles coming for them to exploit. Without that, they'd have nothing new to sell people. They know if they can find ways to sell your own expressions of outrage back to you to cash in on the very frustration that their system creates, they've got you beat. They know that no message you could spread through their channels could be more powerful than the message that your use of their medium itself sends. Stay tuned. No awareness you could possibly raise with television appearances or CDs sold in shopping malls is more important than the awareness of the power of individuals to act for themselves. Television watching and super mall shopping keep people passive, watching things that they can never take part in and people they can never meet. Buying what is marketed to them by corporations rather than making their own music, their own ideas, their own lives. To motivate people to act for themselves, you have to contact them more directly. The values of mass production. We're taught to think of our success in terms of numbers, aren't we? If touching one person's life is a good thing, then touching 1,000 people's lives must be a great thing. It's easy to see where we learn to think this way. Our whole society revolves around mass production. The more units we can move, the more customers we can serve, the more boats we can get, the more money and stuff we have, the better, right? But maybe it's not possible to touch a thousand people as deeply or as powerfully as one person or ten people. And maybe it's not really so revolutionary, after all, to have one person or group telling everybody else what's right. Wouldn't it be better to try a decentralized approach where everyone works closely with those around them instead of a few people leading an anonymous mass? Do you or your band or your label have to save the world all by yourselves? Why don't you trust anyone else to do it with you? And have you noticed how much you have to stomp all over everyone else to get that success you plan to use to spread your message? One political band playing a show to 900 people can recite revolutionary slogans for everyone present to stand and listen to, but they remain out of arm's reach of most of the people there, up on pedestals as musicians, artists, heroes. On the other hand, one band playing an equally impassioned show to 40 people in a more intimate setting can interact on a personal level with everyone there and make it clear that everyone is capable of doing what they do. Thus, they have the potential to spark four more bands or similar revolutionary projects, increasing the impact exponentially. The same goes for record labels, for writers, for speakers and artists, and of course for organizers and leaders of any kind. Working within the system. Most of us don't get much pleasure out of the things we have to do to work inside the system. We'd rather be reading books on our own than writing assigned papers for school, rather be using our skills, energy, and time to work on projects of our own choice rather than selling ourselves to employers. But we feel like we have to work for them, whether we like it or not. It never occurs to us how much more fun, and perhaps more effective, it could be to take our labor out of their hands and do something else with it. Sure, it would be hard at first, but what could be harder than to have to put up with this bullshit for the rest of our lives? Better we dedicate ourselves to replacing it than just dealing with it. But, you protest, you're still going to be fighting the status quo. You're going to change things from the inside, right? That's what they tell you, at least. Of course the system has appropriate procedures for people with grievances to go through to try to make things better. That's the safety valve to release pressure when people get too worked up. Do you think the powers that be would really let anyone use their own laws and methods to depose them? If this system provided opportunities for real change, people would have taken advantage of them a long time ago. Countless generations have set out convinced that they would succeed where others had failed. That's where lawyers and reporters come from, you know. They're the cynical corpses of idealistic young men and women who thought the system could be reformed. Besides, can you trust yourself to work within the system for the right reasons? We're all programmed to want success, to measure ourselves by wealth and social status, whether we like it or not. Could it be that you want to become a journalist or professor or political scientist or rock star because you can't bring yourself to consider any other options seriously, because you're afraid to try cutting the safety line that ties you to the security of a mainstream lifestyle? And how can you be sure it isn't that dark corner of your heart pushing you to seek success, the part that loves the attention and feelings of greatness your popularity and social standing bring? Sure, it feels good to be able to tell your parents what your goals are and have them applaud your decisions, but is that any way to decide how to go about changing the world? Let's listen to our hearts, trust our instincts, and refuse to participate in anything that bores or outrages us. We need to nourish our idealism and our willingness to take risks, 
not work out new ways to integrate our frustration and our desperation for change back into the society that engendered them. Remember, every day we spend using the system is another day we'll have to wait until new networks and better ways of life replace the old ones. How do we get out of here? Yes, it often seems like there's no alternative to working within the system if we want to get things done and not keep our ideas quarantined within the narrow confines of the underground. But why keep the underground quarantined to narrow confines? Surely, if we put all our energy into expanding the spaces in which we can interact as free, equal human beings, rather than trying to repair the burning machinery of this doomed society, we could make at least as much of an impact. Imagine what we could achieve if we kept all our potential in our own hands and refused to waste it ever again, working for their system for even a minute. There's no excuse to let a fraction of our lives go by doing things we don't love, or to let any of our talents and efforts serve to prop up a world order we oppose. Instead, let's fight so hard and live so hard that others inside the cages of mainstream life can see us and are inspired to join us in our complete rejection of the old world and all its bullshit. And let's make our community something greater than they are. Let's make them more open and more capable of offering life support so that others really will be able to join us. The system we live under offers only losers games, so why play them? It's up to us to create new games, more joyous and exciting than the old ones. Let's not try to beat them at their games, but make them join us in ours. Is Crime Think a movement? Dear Crime Think folks, So, you've got all these great ideas here, but why are you wasting them on the deaf ears of punk rockers and other latecomers to dead radicalisms? Shouldn't you be trying to form a new movement of your own? Crime Thinkism? Just like the communists and the nudists did? No. A movement is based on an ideological construct, not a convergence of unique desires, but a standard for what those desires should be, or at best, a set model of how to integrate different desires. As such, movement as a concept has the same relationship to the life we seek as the image does to lived experience. It is an inorganic representation of an organic thing. You can't trap the joys of feeling free and generous and alive in any social construct, be it the adventurous international or the Maoist Boy Scouts, any more than you can render passion permanent in a love relationship by getting married. The adventures and sensations we seek are wild animals, and they won't hold still in the social conventions of any moment, not even for us. This is not to say that forming free associations in pursuit of our goals is always self-defeating. Quite the contrary. But we must be wary, lest our groups become movements. Just as images divert attention from the necessarily invisible things that are truly valuable, for example, the boy who sees a powerful performance by, a, by an anarchist theater troupe and associates the feeling of liberation they invoked at him with their extravagant clothing, so do movements trap us in the trappings, any trappings, whether theoretical, ideological, or practical, organizational structure, tradition, etc., of our real quest, which is for life itself. It shouldn't be hard for the resourceful leader to come up with examples of movements that have begun by channeling vital forces and, end as, and ended as pathetic parodies of them. For politics, the Communist Party. For the arts, surrealism, or jazz, or emo hardcore. For culture, the hippies, the beatniks, the punks. Guy Debord dissolved the Situationist International, an organization partly responsible for the near-successful French Revolution of 1968, shortly after that uprising. When people began trying to join in order to be associated with such a prestigious radical group, rather than because they thought there was something new that they could contribute to it, he explained that he did so to prevent the SI from becoming a movement in the sense described above. Thus their legacy could retain its charge, to be used like a bomb by future generations. This stands as a good example of how we can protect ourselves by keeping ahead of the accumulating inertia of our own endeavors. With images and movements, it is better to remain fleet of foot, to shift unexpectedly, subverting expectations, perhaps flirting playfully with one image or another, as it is impossible to have no image, everything looks like something, but never trusting or committing. And it may be that a good strategy to avoid the stultifying effects of becoming a movement and the dangerous attentions of careerist historicizers, like Real Marcus, is to do our work within supposedly dead movements, like punk rock. By doing so, we emphasize two truths that cannot be emphasized enough, that the life and freedom we seek can pop up anywhere, unexpected, unpredictable. If that's not the case, we really are in trouble, and that there never could be a movement centering around life itself, since it can be found anywhere, but expected nowhere. If history is the chain of events, the casual, deterministic replication of a world in which everything is predictable, or would be, if you had enough information, and the magic of total freedom is impossible, and our revolutionary myths refer to that other, supernatural world, the one that our dreams and desires describe, a world that manifests itself only through transcendent music and similar miracles, phenomena that evoke beauty and meaning without being rationally explicable, then what we are really looking for are loopholes out of history and into that other world. Such loopholes appear every once in a while, 
the greatest of our myths, for example, is that we can somehow pass their event horizon to escape forever from history into the ahistorical space of total freedom. A movement is a historical force, an attempt to act within the chain of events to shift its direction. Such efforts have succeeded in the past, but such success is not what we want. What we want is something that, by its very nature, has never happened before, to break the chain of events that binds us, to bring history to an end, so that an entirely new world can begin. For this to be possible, we'll need the perfect convergence of ahistorical forces. This is not something that can be arranged by any efforts inside the flow of history. It is not something that can be arranged at all, really, but only believed in, as we keep striking matches and tossing them out until one ignites the final fire. Total revolution will not come merely as the result of proper planning and hard work. This isn't wage labor, you know, but out of a leap of faith. Faith in the boundless possibilities of what today appears a sterile and predictable world. Like everything grand or awful in life, it cannot be earned or deserved. Rejecting the assumptions of exchange economy thinking that everything has an exchange value and even revolution can be bought with a certain amount of blood and sweat will help to clarify this. We could work around the clock for the rest of eternity, meticulously constructing and deploying strategy after strategy without coming any closer to real revolution, even if we achieved a few botched counterfeits, like the Russian or Chinese examples. Or, just as possibly, one thoughtlessly defiant creative act at the right moment might be all it takes to start the chain reaction we've dreamed of for so long. Lest this all sound like anarcho-mystical academic nonsense, which it is, of course, freedom cannot be understood except through mysticism. Here's a concrete historical example. The brief adolescent wildness of students, which has traditionally served to appease and squander their libertine impulses and rebellions in preparation for miserable adulthood, has always been a historical force, a tendency easily explained in terms of social conditions, which also serves to maintain them. But at the same time, it has sometimes coexisted with an ahistorical force, those rare sensations of real freedom and weightlessness that youth and student life sometimes create, a phenomenon that can truly be described or explained in terms of history or cause and effect that sociologists might refer to from afar but never actually comprehend. The Situationist International, which is mentioned above, did not set out to create a movement among rebellious students. Such a thing, even if it had succeeded in altering the details of their alienation, would never have been able to spring them out of the history of academia, youth rebellion, Western civilization, and likenesses in general in which they were trapped. Indeed, the Situationists were faithful to their own desires for a world grander than anything that could proceed from the historical trends of their time, and set out to discover and empower other his ahistorical forces concealed in the world around them. To accomplish this, they attempted to create tools of theory and analysis which could be used to drill an escape route right out of the long night of capitalist history. It was the fortuitous encounter of the analytical tools they created with the ahistorical fancies of a mere handful of adventurous students at Strasbourg that unleashed the flood of unchecked desire which nearly transformed the whole world. Read all this as a metaphor if you must, or merely as a new way to interpret history, for everything is history to some of you, casualties of a world that no longer admits to anything magical. But that is how real revolution happens. To get it, we don't need the most flawlessly constructed plans, the most fastidiously organized movements, or the most carefully designed systems. Rather, each of us must be faithful to the yearnings of our heart for things too extravagant to ever fit in this world, and to pursue them to such lengths that others are inspired by their own pursuits. It is this alchemy we need, not another movement. P is for plagiarism, politics, and production. 1. Intellectual property. We have all been taught from our youth there is nothing new under the sun. Whenever a child has an exciting idea, an older person is quick to point out either that this idea has been tried before and didn't work, or that someone else not only has already had the idea, but also has developed and expounded upon it to greater lengths than the child ever could. Learn and choose from the ideas and beliefs already in circulation, rather than seeking to develop and arrange your own, is the message. And this message is sent clearly by the methods of instruction used in both public and private schools throughout the West. Despite this common attitude, or perhaps because of it, we are very possessive of our ideas. The concept of intellectual property is ingrained in the collective psychosis, even deeper than the concept of material property. Plenty of thinkers have asserted that, quote, property is theft in regard to real estate and other physical capital, but few have dared to make similar statements about their own ideas. Even the most notoriously radical thinkers have still proudly claimed their ideas as, first and foremost, their ideas. Consequently, little distinction is made between thinkers and their thoughts. Students of philosophy will study the philosophy of Descartes, students of economics will study Marxism, 
Students of art will study the paintings of Dali. At worst, the cult of personality that develops around famous thinkers prevents any useful consideration of their ideas or artwork. Hero-worshipping partisans will swear allegiance to a thinker and all his thoughts, while others who have some objection to the owner of these ideas have a hard time not being prejudiced against ideas themselves. At best, this emphasis upon the author-owner in the consideration of proportions or artwork is merely irrelevant to the worth of the actual propositions or artwork, even if the stories about the individual in question are interesting and can encourage creative thinking by themselves. The very assumptions behind the concept of intellectual property require more attention than we have given them. The factors that affect the words and deeds of an individual are many and varied, not the least of them being her social, cultural climate and the input of other individuals. To say that an idea has its sole origins in the being of one individual man or woman is to grossly oversimplify. But we are so accustomed to claiming items and objects for ourselves and to being forced to accept similar claims from others in the cutthroat competition that is life in a market economy that it seems natural to do the same with ideas. Certainly there must be other ways of thinking about the origins and ownership of ideas, for our present approach does more than merely distract from the ideas themselves. Our tradition of recognizing intellectual property rights is dangerous in that it results in the deification of the publicly recognized thinker and artist at the expense of everyone else. When ideas are always associated with proper names, and always the same proper names, this suggests that thinking and creating are special skills that belong to a select few individuals. For example, the glorification of the artist in our culture, which includes the stereotyping of artists as eccentric visionaries who exist at the edge, the avant-garde of society, encourages people to believe that artists are significantly and fundamentally different from other human beings. Actually, anyone can be an artist, and everyone is to some extent. But when we are led to believe that being creative and thinking critically are talents which only a few individuals possess, those of us who are not fortunate enough to be christened artists or philosophers by our communities will not make, make much effort to develop these abilities. Consequently, we are dependent upon others for many of our ideas and must be content as spectators of their creative work. Another incidental drawback of our association of ideas with specific individuals is that it promotes the acceptance of these ideas in their original form. Another incidental drawback of our association of ideas with specific individuals is that it promotes the acceptance of these ideas in their original form. The students who learn the philosophy of Descartes are encouraged to learn it in, it, in its orthodox form, rather than learning the parts which they find relevant to their own lives and interests and combining these parts with ideas from other sources. Out of deference to the original thinker, deified as he is in our tradition, his texts and theories are to be preserved as is, without ever being put into new forms or contexts which might reveal new insights. Mummified as they are, many theories become completely irrelevant to modern existence, when they could have been given a new lease on life by being treated with a little less reverence. So we can see that our acceptance of the tradition of intellectual property has negative effects upon our endeavors to think critically and learn from our artistic and philosophical heritage. What can we do to address this problem? One of the possible solutions is plagiarism. 2. Plagiarism and the Modern Revolutionary Plagiarism is an especially effective method of appropriating and reorganizing ideas, and as such, it can be a useful tool for a young man or woman looking to encourage new and exciting thinking in others. And it is a method that is revolutionary in that it does not recognize intellectual property rights, but rather strikes out against them and all of the negative effects that recognizing them can have. Plagiarism focuses attention on content and away from incidental issues by making the genuine origins of the material impossible to ascertain. Besides, as suggested above, it could be argued that the genuine origins of most aspirations and propositions are impossible to determine anyway. By signing a new name, or no name at all, to a text, the plagiarizer puts the material in an entirely new context, and this may generate new perspectives and new thinking about the subject. Plagiarism also makes it possible to combine the best or most relevant parts of a number of texts 
thus creating a new text with many of the virtues of the older ones and some new virtues as well, since the combination of material from different sources is bound to result in unforeseeable effects and might well unlock hidden meanings or possibilities that have been dormant in the texts for years. Finally, above all, plagiarism is the reappropriation of ideas. When an individual plagiarizes a text which those who believe in intellectual property would have held sacred, she denies that there is a difference in rank between herself and the thinker she takes from. She takes the thinker's ideas for herself, to express as she sees fit, rather than treating the thinker as an authority, whose work she is duty-bound to preserve as he intended. She denies, in fact, that there is a fundamental difference between the thinker and the rest of humanity, by appropriating the thinker's material as the property of humanity. After all, a good idea should be available to everyone, should belong to everyone, if it really is a good idea. In a society organized with human happiness as the objective, copyright infringement laws and similar restrictions would not hinder the distribution and recombination of ideas. These impediments only make it more difficult for individuals who are looking for challenging and inspiring material to come upon it and share it with others. So if there truly is nothing new under the sun, take them at their word and act accordingly. Take what seems relevant to your life and your needs from the theories and doctrines of those who came before you. Don't be afraid to reproduce word for word those texts which seem perfect to you, so you can share them with others who might also benefit from them. And at the same time, don't be afraid to plunder ideas from different sources and rearrange them in ways that you find more useful and exciting more relevant to your own needs and experiences. You can create a personalized body of critical and creative thought with elements gathered from a variety of sources rather than just choosing from one of the prefabricated ideologies that are offered to you. After all, do we have ideas or do they have us? 3. Language and the question of authorship itself. Words, musical and artistic conventions, symbols and gestures, all these things are useful only because we hold them in common. That alone makes them currency for communication. Human beings, just like everything else in the world, are not isolated entities. Each of us exists as a part of a vast web, as an intersection of strands that proceed from every direction. None of us could be what we are if not for the others around us and before us, and the natural world beyond. Our thoughts are constructed from the languages spoken around us, our values and narratives are assembled from the found objects of this world. We represent our experiences and memories to ourselves in the configurations developed by the civilization that raised us. This is not to say that nothing is original. Rather, everything is original. For every expression, every action, however frequently repeated, issues from a unique point in the web of human relations. But at the same time, this means that the recontextualization of pre-existing elements, which some call plagiarism, is essential to all communication, and if every expression is both borrowed and unique, it seems absurd to try to separate expressions into one category or the other. Yes, each of us participates in the continuation and evolution of the languages we speak, but in truth, the line between imitation and innovation is so blurry that any distinctions are bound to be arbitrary. If that is the case, then let us leave it to the scientists to figure out the chronological detail of who was the first to arrange words or musical notes in a particular order. Much more important for us is what we can do with these combinations of shared elements. Some claim for themselves the rights of ownership over combinations they believe, rightly or not, they were the first to apply. Many of them justify this by insisting that these combinations are the perfect expression of their emotions or experiences and that those who read or hear them are being granted direct access to their souls. But the fact is, a poem or song always has a different significance for the listener or reader than it did for the composer. The reader applies the words to her own experiences, searches her heart to see which ones will resonate with the unique emotions she has felt. Like it or not, once you create something and send it out into the world, it has a life of its own, in the reactions and emotions it provokes in others and it will not answer to you or represent you except by coincidence. For the writer, the true significance of the work is in the act of creation itself, in the rearranging and shaping of forms. Those who hope to retain control of the products of their creation afterwards are living in denial. 
Thus we can throw out all the superstitions surrounding the author's signature, the question of so-called authenticity, the glorification of self-expression, the concept of intellectual property, and see the significance for what it really is, another element of the composition itself. The signing of a work is a part of the creative process. It offers a context in which the work will be interpreted. What signature could truly capture the complete origins of a work, anyway, considering all the disparate and ancient components that make up any given work of art, and all the human relations and innovations that were necessary to arrive at them? For that matter, if the notion of a fixed, distinct identity of individuals is also a superstition, that renders even the possibility of an individual signature preposterous. If one wanted to be honest, one would sign the name of one's entire civilization to one's poetry or pottery, and add to that the seal of cosmos from which it arose, effectively communalizing the work. This being the case, if the signature is just another element of the composition, it makes just as much sense to sign with another's name, or with a false name, complete perhaps with a fabricated identity, depending on which can offer the context that will best enhance the content of the work. For once we are through with the delusion that we can own expressions, we can focus on the real question of how to create expressions, context and all, that will best serve to help us find ourselves and each other, and then to transform what we find. Disclaimer. All this extolling of artistic theft is not meant to be taken as an endorsement of mere repetition. Young would-be plagiarists sometimes miss the point of recontextualization entirely and think that it is enough just to parrot what those around them say. But you're not likely to say anything true or important like that, are you? Face it, your politics are boring as fuck. You know it's true. Otherwise, why does everyone cringe when you say the word? Why has attendance at your anarcho-communist theory discussion group meetings fallen to an all-time low? Why has the oppressed proletariat not come to its senses and joined you in your fight for world liberation? Perhaps, after years of struggling to educate them about their victimhood, you have come to blame them for their condition. They must want to be ground under the heel of capitalist imperialism. Otherwise, why do they show no interest in your political causes? Why haven't they joined you yet in chaining yourself to mahogany furniture, chanting slogans at carefully planned and orchestrated protests, and frequenting anarchist bookshops? Why haven't they sat down and learned all the terminology necessary for a genuine understanding of the complexities of Marxist economic theory? The truth is, your politics are boring to them because they really are irrelevant. They know that your antiquated styles of protest, your marches, handheld signs and gatherings, are now powerless to effect real change because they have become such a predictable part of the status quo. They know that your post-Marxist jargon is off-putting because it really is a language of mere academic dispute, not a weapon capable of undermining systems of control. They know that your infighting, your splinter groups, and endless quarrels over ephemeral theories can never affect any real change in the world they experience from day to day. They know that no matter who is in office, what laws are on the books, what isms the intellectuals march under, the content of their lives will remain the same. They, we, know that our boredom is proof that these politics are not the key to any real transformation of life. For our lives are boring enough already, and you know it too. For how many of you is politics a responsibility? Something you engage in because you feel you should, when in your heart of hearts there are a million things you would rather be doing. Your volunteer work, is it your most favorite pastime, or do you do it out of a sense of obligation? Why do you think it is so hard to motivate others to volunteer as you do? Could it be that it is, above all, a feeling of guilt that drives you to fulfill your duty to be politically active? Perhaps you spice up your work by trying, consciously or not, to get in trouble with the authorities to get arrested, not because it will practically serve your cause, but to make things more exciting, to recapture a little of the romance of turbulent times now long past. Have you ever felt that you were participating in a ritual? a long-established tradition of fringe protests that really serves only to strengthen the position of the mainstream? Have you ever secretly longed to escape from the stagnation and boredom of your political responsibilities? It's no wonder that no one has joined you in your political endeavors. Perhaps you tell yourself that it's tough, 
thankless work, but somebody's got to do it. The answer is, well, no. You actually do us all a real disservice with your tiresome, tedious politics. For in fact, there is nothing more important than politics. Not the politics of American democracy and law, of who is elected state legislator to sign the same bills and perpetuate the same system. Not the politics of the, I got involved with the radical left because I enjoy quibbling over trivial details and writing rhetorically about unreachable utopia anarchist. Not the politics of any leader or ideology that demands that you make sacrifices for the cause, but the politics of our everyday lives. When you separate politics from the immediate, everyday experiences of individual men and women, it becomes completely irrelevant. Indeed, it becomes the private domain of wealthy, comfortable intellectuals who can trouble themselves with such dreary theoretical things. When you involve yourself in politics out of a sense of obligation and make political action into a dull responsibility rather than an exciting game that is worthwhile for its own sake, you scare away people whose lives are already far too dull for any more tedium. When you make politics into a lifeless thing, a joyless thing, a dreadful responsibility, it becomes just another weight upon people, rather than a means to lift weight from people. And thus you ruin the idea of politics for the people to whom it should be most important. For everyone has a stake in considering their lives, in asking themselves what they want out of life and how they can get it. But you make politics look to them like a miserable, self-referential, pointless middle-class bohemian game, a game with no relevance to the real lives they are living out. What should be political? Whether we enjoy what we do to get food and shelter? Whether we feel like our daily interactions with our friends, neighbors, and co-workers are fulfilling? whether we have the opportunity to live each day the way we desire to. And politics should consist not of merely discussing these questions, but of acting directly to improve our lives in the immediate present, acting in a way that is itself entertaining, exciting, joyous, because political action that is tedious, tiresome, and oppressive can only perpetuate tedium, fatigue, and oppression in our lives. No more time should be wasted debating over issues that will be irrelevant when we must go to work again the next day. No more predictable ritual protests that the authorities know all too well how to deal with. No more boring ritual protests which will not sound like a thrilling way to spend a Saturday afternoon to potential volunteers. Clearly, those won't get us anywhere. Never again shall we sacrifice ourselves for the cause. For we ourselves, happiness in our own lives and the lives of our fellows, must be our cause. After we make politics relevant and exciting, the rest will follow. But from a dreary, merely theoretical and or ritualized politics, nothing valuable can follow. This is not to say that we should show no interest in the welfare of humans, animals, or ecosystems that do not contact us directly in our day-to-day -day existence, but the foundation of our politics must be concrete. It must be immediate. It must be obvious to everyone why it is worth the effort. It must be fun in itself. How can we do positive things for others if we ourselves do not enjoy our own lives? To make this concrete for a moment, an afternoon of collecting food from businesses that would have thrown it away and serving it to hungry people and people who are tired of working to pay for food, that is a good political action, but only if you enjoy it. If you do it with your friends, if you meet new friends while you're doing it, if you fall in love or trade funny stories, or just feel proud to have helped a woman by easing her financial needs, that's good political action. On the other hand, if you spend the afternoon typing an angry letter to an obscure leftist tabloid objecting to its columnist's use of the term anarcho-syndicalist, that's not going to accomplish shit, and you know it. Perhaps it is time for a new word for politics, since you have made such a swear word out of the old one. For no one should be put off when we talk about acting together to improve our lives. And so we present to you our demands, which are non-negotiable and must be met as soon as possible, because we're not going to live forever, are we? 1. Make politics relevant to our everyday experience of life again. The farther away the object of our political concern, the less it will mean to us, the less real and pressing it will seem to us, and the more wearisome politics will be. 2. All political activity must be joyous and exciting in itself. You cannot escape from dreariness with more dreariness. 3. 
To accomplish those first two steps, entirely new political approaches and methods must be created. The old ones are outdated, outmoded. Perhaps they were never any good, and that's why our world is the way it is now. 4. Enjoy yourselves. There is never any excuse for being bored, or boring. Join us in making the revolution a game. A game played for the highest stakes of all, but a joyous, carefree game nonetheless. Product is the Excrement of Action by Jeanette Winterson Today our lives revolve around things. We measure our worth in terms of our material possessions, in terms of our control over things outside ourselves. We gauge our success in life in terms of our productivity, that is, our ability to make these things. Our social system revolves around the production and consumption of material goods more than anything else. Even when we are not thinking about material objects, we represent our lives to ourselves as things. We consider our accomplishments, our future prospects, our social position, anything but how we actually feel. The end justifies the means, we say. That is, the products of our actions, the end results of our lives, are more important to us than the process of living itself. But products are the excrement of actions. Product is what is left over when the dust settles and the pulse returns to normal, when the day is done, when the coffin is laid in the ground. We do not exist in the settling dust or the scorecard. We are here in the present tense, in the making, the doing, the feeling. Just as we try to immortalize ourselves by fleeing into the world of fixed, deathless images, we try to externalize ourselves by thinking in terms of the results of our actions rather than our experience of the actions themselves. After all, it's so complicated to have to worry about whether you are really enjoying yourself, how you're feeling in the moment. It is easier to focus on the results, the hard evidence of your life. These things seem easier to understand and easier to control. Of course, today's average worker is used to thinking about the ends rather than the means. He spends most of his time and energy working at a job that in all likelihood does not fulfill his dreams. He looks forward to payday every two weeks, for he counts on his paycheck to make sense out of his life. Without it, he would feel like he was wasting his time. If he didn't look at the consequences of his actions as a justification for them, life would be unbearable. What if he constantly considered how he was feeling as he bagged groceries, or asked himself if he was having fun every moment he struggled with the fax machine? Insofar as his everyday experience of life is tedious and meaningless, he needs to concentrate on the coming weekend, the next vacation, his next purchases, to fend off insanity. And eventually he is bound to generalize that mode of thinking to other parts of his life. He comes to evaluate possible actions according to the rewards they offer, just as he would evaluate a job according to the wage it offers. Thus, the present has lost almost all significance for modern man. Instead, he spends his life always planning for the future, he studies for a diploma rather than for the pleasure of learning. He chooses his job for social status, wealth, and security rather than for joy. He saves his money for big purchases and vacation trips rather than to buy his way out of wage slavery and into full-time freedom. When he finds himself experiencing profound happiness with another human being, he tries to freeze that moment, to turn it into a permanent fixture, a contract, by marrying her. On Sundays, he goes to church where he is told to do good deeds in order to one day receive external salvation. As Nietzsche says, the good Christian still wants to be paid well, rather than for the sheer pleasure of helping others. The, quote, aristocratic disregard for consequences, that ability to act for the sake of action that every hero possesses, is far beyond him. It is a cliché that men and women of middle class and middle age have a hard time putting aside their insurance policies and investment programs to seize the moment. But all too often, we too end up exchanging present for future and experience for souvenirs. We save mementos, trophies, boxes of keepsakes, old letters, as if life can be gathered, stored up, frozen for later. For later? For when? Life is here with us now, running through us like a river, and like a river, it cannot be held in place without losing its magic. The more time we spend trying to save it up, the less we have to throw ourselves into it. The worst of us, in fact, are the radicals and artists. All too often, we revolutionaries expend our efforts thinking and talking about a revolution that is to come, 
rather than concentrating on making revolution in the present tense. We're so used to thinking in terms of production that even when we try to make life into something immediate and exciting, we still end up centering our efforts around an event in the future. And like factory supervisors, we worry more about our productivity, the number of new believers recruited, the progress of the cause, etc., than about how we and our fellow human beings are feeling and living. Artists suffer from this tendency most of all, for their vocation itself depends on making products out of the raw material of real-life experience. There is something of the capitalist lust for domination in the way that artists mold their emotions and experiences into forms of their own making through the act of expression. For the expression of feelings and sensations, unique and unfathomable as they are, always consist of a kind of simplification. It isn't enough for the artist to just experience and appreciate life as it really is. She comes to cannibalize her life for what is really a career, a series of products outside herself, even adjusting her life for her career's sake. Worse, she may find that she cannot make love on a rooftop at daybreak without planning for the excellent scene for her novel, Excrement, this will make for. Certainly, excretion is a healthy and necessary function of the soul as well as the body, and there is a place for art in our lives as a way to pour feeling back into the world when the heart is full to overflowing. But if you keep trying to do it after it is unnecessary, you eventually force out your heart and the rest of your insides. Remember the fairy tale of the goose and the golden eggs? We must put life and experience first. We must meet the world with only this in mind, as fresh and innocent as when we were children, with no intentions to cannibalize, categorize, organize, or simplify the profound infinities of our experiences. Otherwise, we will miss what is most vital, most beautiful, most immediate in this world. In our search for things that can be pressed flat and preserved, quote, for all time. Imagination should be used first and foremost to transform everyday reality, not just to make symbolic representations of it. How many exciting novels could be written about the sorts of lives that most of us lead these days anyway? Let us make living our art, rather than seeking to make mere art out of our lives. Let's stop making history. We're all so obsessed with making a mark and start living. That would be a real revolution. S is for sex and space. Vanguard of the sexual revolution. An ad hoc committee consisting of all the people at any given time who are having sex that either is broadening to their personal horizons is socially prohibited, or takes place in a barely concealed public space. It often includes fresh young lovers, reckless life artist types, and men and women of all ages entering into unexpected affairs. Masturbating adolescents who live with their parents are always considered honorary members. Conquest-seeking so-called libertines are excluded on principle, of course. Here is the VSR Manifesto, composed by Nadia C., in a library one night when she hadn't made love for an agitating three days, or perhaps on a still Christmas morning after a night of passionate sex with a woman she had wanted for years. A call in to arms. Because we get to have so little honest, intimate, beautifully dangerous sex that they can sell us flat images of it instead, because we spend so much more time contemplating these representations than having sex, that when we do sleep together, it is more a meeting of roles than of individuals, and not supportive or satisfying roles at that. Because the most radical of us would still rather speak fancifully of total revolution than dare a moment of actual experimentation in a field that really matters, like our beds. Because as long as our own sexualities are constructed by the media of silence and the culture of violence, each of us is a Trojan horse bearing our own enemies, the fetishization of domination and submission, the paralysis of fear and shame, everywhere we go. It's time to stop being spectators and start being actors, or agents if you prefer, the double meaning being very much intended, to take our desires back by converting our sex lives from passive recreation into active recreation. And to do this, we must first replace the representations of sex in our lives and all around us with real sex. Our numbers are greater than you think. 
You are one of us each time you transform public space, not by privatizing it. It's already deprived of anything personal at all. Thus the irony that the public is actually the least public of spaces. But by making it into real people space, by doing something in it that truly feels liberating. For example, fucking. On the roof of the police station, at the shore, on the rocks, just below the art museum window, etc. Not that public sex is always itself revolutionary sex, but such sex is always revolutionary in that it takes love making out of the narrow confines in which it is permitted, that is, in which it is permitted to languish, caged and stripped of the spontaneity that is its lifeblood, just as we languish with the rest of the world stripped of it. They shall know us by the innocence of our guilty smiles, holding hands as we walk out of the fog in parks at night, transformed and transcendent, unbowed and uninhibited in this dry and dreamless world by used birth control devices and left in university classrooms and office bathrooms by growing numbers of women who know exactly what they want and men who aren't afraid to touch one another. We will be the spark that ignites the new sexual revolution, armies of lovers laying down their responsibilities and picking up each other as weapons to fight against the smothering joylessness of this world, to quote the skinhead's anthem of homophobia and intolerance back at them, we refuse to, quote, stay in the closet because it's safe in there, precisely for that reason. As we've learned time and again in this struggle, our only safety is in danger. Lovers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your shame and a world of pleasure to win. Reprinted from the Annual Bulletin of Saboteurs. For the Revolution of the Erotic and the Erotica of Revolution, contact Crime Think Incorporated, Vice Squad. Note 1. Although it's worth pointing out that most of the birth control methods slash devices in use in our culture today are themselves far from radical or liberating, another aspect of the commodification of our lives in general, and sexuality in particular, is that we're supposed to buy a product for everything, even the most natural and personal of our, of our activities, like sex. More often than not, a chemical product that fucks around with our bodies in a hundred scary ways, too. Look around you and you'll see that there are alternatives, not just to the birth control methods on the market today, but also to the traditional ways of making love and being sexual that mainstream culture offers us. Note 2. Of course there are those who will read this entire manifesto as an exhortation to littering, based on the extravagance of this single phrase. To such dreariness, I can only respond with a merry, fuck you. Alienation, the map of despair. In the modern world, control is exerted over us automatically by the spaces we live in and move in. We go through certain rituals in our lives, work, leisure, consumption, submission, because our world is designed for these alone. We all know malls are for shopping, offices are for working, ironically named living rooms are for watching television, and schools are for obeying teachers. All the spaces we travel in have preset meanings. And all it takes to keep us going through the same motions is to keep us moving along the same paths. It's hard to find anything to do in Walmart, but look at and purchase merchandise. And, accustomed to this as we are, it's hard to conceive that there could be anything else we could do in there anyway. Not to mention that doing anything but shopping there is pretty much illegal when you think about it. There are fewer and fewer free, undeveloped spaces left in the world where we can let our bodies and minds run free. Almost every place you go belongs to some person or group, which has already designated a meaning and prescribed use for it. Private estate, shopping district, superhighway, classroom, national park. And our very predictable routes through the world rarely take us near the free areas that do remain. These spaces, where thought and pleasure can be free in every sense, are being replaced with carefully controlled environments like Disneyland, places in which our desires are prefabricated and sold back to us at our financial and emotional expense, giving our own meaning to the world and creating our own ways to play and act in it are fundamental parts of human life. Today, when we are never in spaces that encourage this, it should be no surprise that so many of us feel desperate and unfulfilled. But because the world has so little free space left in it, and the circuitry of our everyday lives never takes us there, we're forced to go to places like Disneyland for any semblance of play and excitement at all, 
The real adventure our hearts crave has been largely replaced by fake adventure and the thrill of creation by the drill of spectatorship. Our time is as thoroughly occupied and regulated as our space. Indeed, the subdivision of our space is a manifestation of what has already happened to our time. The entire world moves and lives according to a standardized time system, designed to synchronize our movements from one side of the planet to the other. Inside this large system, we all have our lives regimented by our work schedules and or school hours, as well as the hours that public transportation runs and businesses operate, etc. This scheduling of our lives, which begins in childhood, exerts a subtle but deep control over us all. We come to forget that the time of our lives is ultimately ours to spend how we choose, and instead think in terms of work days, lunch hours, and weekends. A truly spontaneous life is unthinkable to most of us, and so-called free time is usually just time that has been scheduled for something other than work. How often do you get to see the sunrise? How many sunny afternoon walks do you get to take? If you had the unexpected opportunity to take an exciting trip this week, could you do it? These restricting environments and schedules drastically limit the vast potential of our lives. They also keep us isolated from each other. At our jobs, we spend a great deal of time doing one particular kind of labor with one particular group of people in one set place, or at least in one set environment, for construction workers and temp employees. Such limited repetitive experience gives us a very limited perspective on the world and keeps us from coming to know people from other backgrounds. Our homes isolate us further. Today we keep ourselves locked apart in little boxes, partly out of fear of those capitalism has treated even worse than ourselves, and partly we believe the paranoia propaganda of the companies that sell security systems. Today's suburbs are cemeteries of community, the people packed separately into boxes, just like our supermarket products, sealed for freshness. With thick walls between us and our neighbors, and our friends and families scattered across cities and nations, it's hard to have any kind of community at all, let alone share community space in which people can benefit from each other's creativity. And both our homes and our jobs keep us tied down to one place, stationary, unable to travel far through the world except on hasty vacations. Even our travel is restricted and restricting. Our modern methods of transportation, cars, buses, subways, trains, airplanes, all keep us locked onto fixed tracks, watching the outside world go by through a screen, as if it were a particularly boring television show. Each of us lives in a personal world that consists mostly of well-known destinations, the workplace, the grocery store, a friend's apartment, the dance club, with a few links in between them, sitting in the car, standing in the subway, walking up the staircase and little chance to encounter anything unexpected or discover any new places. A man could travel the freeways of ten nations without seeing anything but asphalt and gas stations so long as he stayed in his car. Locked onto our tracks, we can't imagine truly free travel, voyages of discovery that would bring us into direct contact with brand new people and things at every turn. Instead, we sit in traffic jams, surrounded by hundreds of people in the same predicament as ourselves, but separated from them by the steel cages of our cars, so they appear to us as objects in our way rather than fellow human beings. We think we are reaching more of the world with our modern transportation, but in fact, we see less of it, if anything. As our transportation capabilities increase, our cities sprawl farther and farther across the landscape. Whenever travel distances increase, more cars are needed. More cars demand more space, and thus distances increase again and again. At this rate, highways and gas stations will one day replace everything that was worth traveling to in the first place. Everything that hasn't already been turned into a theme park or a tourist attraction, that is. Some of us look at the internet as the final frontier, as a free, undeveloped space still ripe for exploring. Cyberspace may or may not offer some degree of freedom to those who can afford to use and explore it. But whatever it might offer, it offers on the condition that we check our bodies at the door. Voluntary amputation. Remember, you are a body at least as much as a mind. Is it freedom to sit, stationary, staring at glowing lights for hours without using your senses of taste, touch, or smell? Have you forgotten the sensations of wet grass or warm sand under your bare feet, of eucalyptus trees or hickory smoke in your nostrils? Do you remember the scent of tomato stems, the glint of candlelight, 
the thrill of running, swimming, touching. Today we can turn to the internet for excitement without feeling like we have been cheated, because our modern lives are so constrained and predictable that we have forgotten how joyous action and motion in the real world can be. Why settle for the very limited freedom that cyberspace can provide, when there is so much more experience and sensation to be had out there in the real world? We should be running, dancing, canoeing, drinking life to the dregs, exploring new worlds. What new worlds? We must rediscover our bodies, our senses, the space around us, and then we can transform this space into a new world to which we can impart meanings of our own. To this end, we need to invent new games. Games that can take place in the conquered spaces of this world, in the shopping malls and restaurants and classrooms, that will break down their prescribed meanings so that we can give them new meanings in our accordance with our own dreams and desires. We need games that will bring us together, out of the confinement and isolation of our private homes, and into the public spaces where we can benefit from each other's company and creativity. Just as natural disasters and power outages can bring people together and be exciting for them, after all, they do make for a little thrilling variety in an otherwise drearily predictable world, our games will join us together in doing new and exciting things. We should have poetry painted on the walls of the shopping districts, concerts in the streets, sex in the parks and classrooms, free picnics in supermarkets, spontaneous festivals on freeways. We need to invent new conceptions of time and new modes of travel as well. Try living without a clock, without synchronizing your life with the rest of the busy, busy world. Try taking a long trip on foot or bicycle so that you will encounter everything that you pass between your starting point and your destination firsthand without a screen. Try exploring in your own neighborhood, looking on rooftops and around corners you never noticed before. You'll be amazed how much adventure is hidden there waiting for you. Real maps of the imaginary world. Imaginary maps of the real world. Our present maps describe a world no human being has ever set foot in. A world of carefully measured distances and standardized symbols, frozen in time, empty of emotional ambiances. An objective world, when today we all know that there is no world but the subjective. These maps hold so little information of real relevance to human life that it is no wonder we get so lost using them. Around and around in circles we go, arriving on time at our supposed destinations, with no real idea of where we're bound or why, let alone what there is to be found in this world beyond interstate highways and Newark, New Jersey. If we made our maps ourselves, plotting our individual experiences rather than the data provided by our instruments, they would reveal clearly what it is like to be a human being in this world. Perhaps then we could go about creating a world for human beings to live in, not instruments. A book like On the Road is an example of one of these maps. It charts the path of a few individuals through space and time, chronicling the traffic of their hearts as well as the motion of their bodies. Granted, it might not be much use for figuring out street directions to a gas station in Denver, but in the long run, it will help you get a lot further than a road map of Colorado ever could. It's true that we all experience the world differently, and that if we make our maps sincerely, i.e. subjectively, they will all look different. But that should be cause to celebrate the breadth of the world, not to grumble. And just as a novel about people you have never met can serve as a useful map for your own life, these very individual records can often be useful for many other people, and in a variety of ways. You'll find that if you speak honestly for yourself, you are probably speaking for others as well. That's a part of being human, and our excuse for throwing around the word we so mercilessly in these pages. T is for technology. Here is folk science. There's nothing wrong with tools, technology, and science. As a species, we are nothing if not the inventors and builders of our world, but as individuals, we have the capacity to determine what world we want and to build it ourselves. When we do this, we seize the adventure, the invention, the inventure. That is our birthright. This is folk science. Folk science is not new. It is as old as humanity. Lab coats, the scientific method, and centralized top-down technology are new. As we progress, we will learn to view these things as aberrations of the innate scientific creativity that is a part of each person. As folk scientists, we will see that consensus science, with its universal explanations and solutions, taught us to distrust our own ingenuity, creativity, and intuition. 
folk science versus the scientific method. The scientific method is a universal format and language for experimentation. Among other things, the scientific method is a way of packaging the results of one scientist's inquiry so that they are accessible to other scientists. Thus, the scientific method acts as a net combining the efforts of all the world's scientists. Using this powerful Babylonian tool, scientists cooperate to surpass our every need and bring us into their modernity ever faster and more efficiently. As a scientific method-driven phenomenon, modernity tells us there is no use for repeating. This view is the source of the oft-heard comment, that's been done, a retort tantamount to death for a scientific act. Used in this way, the scientific method becomes a method for encouraging the progress of the group over the progress of the individual. So our critique of the scientific method skips science, because it is a fundamental tool of our species, skips method, for method is the enactment of science, but finds the guilty of crime. This tyranny of the is part of a language that attempts to unify the menagerie of human curiosity and struggle into just one investigative technique, and in doing so, fails both science and humanity. Folk Science and Art At the root, art and science are the same. Both of these pursuits use the observation and experience that are part of every life as a basis for creative thought, ingenuity, and production. But as science has become universalized and gathered up into the hands of the few, it has also come to alienate the many. The alienation of consensus science has also infected art. From color field painting to canned shit, art has become a that's-been-done style and game. This process is encouraged when critics and historians who love logic, order, and their jobs support art that contributes to the linear progress of art history. This is art in a technological mode. In the face of a system that cares only for final products, folk scientists reclaim the processes of scientific and artistic discovery as inherently valuable. Folk scientists see the beauty, adventure, and relevance in reinventing the wheel. So a phrase like, that's been done, is dribble to the folk scientists, who will respond, not by me. By holding invention as a form of play, folk scientists are free from the tradition of linear progress that has stolen creativity from the uninitiated and made science and art into unattainable priesthoods. The Folk Science of Love Professional scientists have become intermediaries between us and our world. But nowadays, these intermediaries can be found everywhere. These doctors, designers, evangelists, and psychologists are a priest cast in the business of connecting the lowly individual to the universe, health, God, happiness, even love. I want to think that, had I not seen kissing on television, I would have spontaneously come up with this, this bizarre interaction, but I can't know. We are so saturated with icons of love and mass media that, like science and art, this natural impulse becomes the business of experts. These sleek actors and porn stars let us fumble with our awkward bodies, botched lines, and improper lighting, then step up to show us how it's really done. The greatest achievement of any lover is to transcend the bombardment of glossy images and find their own way. So here is folk science, where we make it a daily practice to find our own way. Here it's not too late to invent the airplane, the bicycle, the kiss. Here there is room for inquiry into gravity, cancer, psychology, and ant hills. Here, incredulous, we set out to see if the world is round, and find that it is not. So don't spend your money, which wears away like the soles of your shoes. Spend your ingenuity, which is alive and becomes sharper with wear. Spend your time, which, combined with ingenuity, seems ever more abundant. Spend your life, the only gift you can hoard jealously and give graciously at the same time. Deploy. Why I Love Shoplifting from Big Corporations by U.M. Anonymous Nothing compares to the feeling of elation, of burdens being lifted and constraints escaped, that I feel when I walk out of a corporate store with their products in my pockets. In a world where everything already belongs to someone else, where I am expected to sell away my life at work in order to get the money to pay for the minimum I need to survive, where I am surrounded by forces beyond my control or comprehension that obviously are not concerned about my needs or welfare, it is a way to carve out a little piece of the world for myself, to act back upon a world that acts so much upon me. It is an entirely different sensation than the one I feel when I buy something. When I pay for something, I'm making a trade. I'm offering the money I bought with my labor, my time, and my creativity for a product or service that the corporation wouldn't share with me under any other circumstances. In a sense, we have a relationship based on violence. We negotiate in exchange not according to our respect or concern for each other, but according to the forces that we can bring to bear on each other. Supermarkets know they can charge me a dollar for bread because I will starve if I do not buy it. They know they can't charge me four dollars because I will buy it somewhere else. So our interaction revolves around unspoken threats rather than love, and I am forced to give up something of my own to get anything from them. 
Everything changes when I shoplift. I'm no longer negotiating with faceless and human entities who have no concern for my welfare. Instead, I'm taking what I need without giving anything up. I no longer feel like I'm being forced into an exchange, and I no longer feel as if I have no control over the way the world around me dictates my life. I no longer have to worry about whether the pleasure I received from the book I purchased was equal to the two hours of labor it cost me to be able to afford it. And these, in a thousand ways, shoplifting makes me feel liberated and empowered. Let's examine what shoplifting has to offer as an alternative way of consuming. The shoplifter wins her prize by taking risks, not by exchanging a piece of her life for it. Life for her is not something that must be sold away for 7 or $8 an hour in return for survival. It is something that is hers because she takes it for herself, because she lays claim to it. In stark contrast to the law-abiding consumer, the means by which she acquires goods is as exciting as the goods themselves, and this means is also, in many ways, more praiseworthy. Shoplifting is a refusal of the exchange economy. It is a denial that people deserve to eat, live, and die based on how effectively they are able to exchange their labor and capital with others. It is a denial that a monetary value can be ascribed to everything, that having a piece of delicious chocolate in your mouth is worth exactly 50 cents, or that an hour of one person's life can really be worth $10 more than that of another person. It is a refusal to accept the capitalist system in which workers have to buy back the products of their own labor at a profit to the owners of capital who get them coming and going. Shoplifting says no to all the objectionable features that have come to characterize the modern corporation. It is an expression of discontent with the low wages and lack of benefits that so many exploiting corporations force their employees to suffer in the name of company profits. It is a refusal to pay for low-quality products that have been designed to break or wear out soon in order to force consumers to buy more. It is a refusal to fund the environmental damage that so many corporations per perpetrate heartlessly in the course of manufacturing their products and building new stores. A refusal to support the corporations that run private, local businesses into bankruptcy. A refusal to accept the murder of animals in the meat and dairy industries and the exploitation of migrant labor in the fruit and vegetable industries. Shoplifting makes a statement against the alienation of the modern consumer. If we are not able to find or afford any products other than these that were made a thousand miles from us and about which we can know nothing, it asserts, then we refuse to pay for these. The shoplifter attacks the cynical mind control tactics of modern advertising. Today's commercials, billboards, even the floor layouts and product displays in store are designed by psychologists to manipulate potential consumers into purchasing products. Corporations carry out extensive advertising campaigns to insinuate their exhortations to consumption into every mind, and even work to make their products into status symbols that people from some walks of society eventually must own in order to be accorded respect. Faced with this kind of manipulation, the law-abiding consumer has two choices. Either come up with the money to purchase these products by selling his life away as a wage laborer, or go without and possibly invite public ridicule as well as private frustration. The shoplifter creates a third choice of her own. She takes the products she has been conditioned to desire without paying for them, so the corporations themselves must pay for all their propagandizing and mind control tactics. Shoplifting is the most effective protest against all these objectionable attributes of modern corporations because it is not merely theoretical, it is practical, it involves action. Verbal protests can be raised to irresponsible business practices without ever having any solid effect, but shoplifting is intrinsically damaging these corporations at the same time as it, however covertly, demonstrates dissatisf dissatisfaction. It is better than a boycott because not only does it cost the corporation money rather than just denying a profit, it also means that the shoplifter is still able to obtain the products which he may need to survive. And in these days when so many corporations are interconnected and so many multinationals are involved in unacceptable activity, shoplifting is a generalized protest. It is a refusal to put any cash into the economy at all, so the shoplifter can be sure that none of her cash will ever end up in the hands of the corporations she approves of. In addition to that, she will have to work less for them, as well. But what about the people in the corporations? What about their welfare? First of all, corporations are distinct from the traditional private businesses in that they exist as separate financial entities from their owners. So the shoplifter is stealing from the non-human entity, not directly from the pocket of a human being. Second. Since so many workers are paid set wages, minimum wage, for example, that depend more on how little the corporation can get away with paying rather than how much profit it is taking, the shoplifter is not really hurting most of the workforce at any given company either. The stockholders, who are almost always far richer than your average thief, are the ones who stand to lose a little if the company suffers significant losses. But realistically, no campaign of shoplifting could be intense enough to force any of the wealthy individuals who profit from these companies into poverty. Besides, modern corporations have money set aside for shoplifting losses because they anticipate them. That's correct. These corporations are aware that there is enough dissatisfaction with them and their capitalist economy that people are going to steal from them remorselessly. 
In that sense, shoplifters are just playing their role in society, just like CEOs. More significantly, these corporations are cynical enough to go about their business as usual, even though they know this leaves many of their customers and employees ready to steal anything from them if they can. If they are willing to continue doing business in this way, even when they are aware of how many people it alienates, they should not be surprised that people continue stealing from them. And as for the myth that shoplifting drives prices up cons for consumers, you don't think the prices you're paying are actually determined just by the cost of making and distributing the products, do you? Again, these corporations are charging you as much as they think they can get away with. The market, not their expenses, determines the prices. If the money they set aside for shoplifting losses doesn't get used, the owners are more likely to keep it for themselves or invest it in opening more shops, and thus running more independent businesses out of the market, than to share any of it with their much poorer employees, let alone pass it along to the consumer in decreased prices. If enough products were shoplifted from a corporate store that they had to raise their prices, that would drive consumers out of their clutches into less globally harmful local shops anyway. Does that sound so bad? Shoplifting is more than a way to survive in the cutthroat competition of the free market and protest corporate injustices. It is also a different orientation to the world and life in general. The shoplifter makes do with an environment that has been conquered by capitalism and industry, where everything has become private property and there is no longer a natural world from which to gather resources without accepting it or the absurd way of life it entails. She takes her life into her own pants by applying an ancient method to the problem of modern survival. She lives by urban hunting and gathering. In this way, she is able to live much as her distant ancestors did before the world was subjugated by technology, imperialism, and the irrational demands of the free market. And she can find the same challenges and rewards in her work, rewards that are lost to the rest of us today. For her, the world is as dangerous and as exciting as it was to prehistoric humanity. Every day, she is in new situations, confronting new risks, living by her wits in a constantly changing environment. For the law-abiding consumer, chances are that every day at work is similar to the last one, and danger is as sorely lacking in life as meaning and purpose are. To shoplift is to affirm immediate bodily desires, such as hunger, over abstract ethics, and over such ethereal constructs, most of which are left over from a deceased Christianity anyway. Shoplifting divests the commodity, and the marketplace in general, of the mythical power it seems to have to control the lives of consumers. When commodities are seized by force, they show themselves for what they are, merely resources that have been held by force by these corporations at the expense of everyone else. Shoplifting places us back in the physical world, where things are real, where things are nothing more than their physical characteristics. Weight, taste, e ease of acquisition are not invested with superstitious qualities such as market value and profit margin. It forces us to take risks and experience life firsthand again. Perhaps shoplifting alone will not be able to overthrow industrial society or the capitalist system, but in the meantime, it is one of the best forms of protest and self-empowerment, and one of the most practical, too.